The, is it the Northeast Maritime Academy? Mm -hmm. That's where he got his captain's license? Yes. Is that something that, um, that 18 is normal? Um, I, not, not what his professor said. He was in a class of just older men. And while he was going for his captain's license, was he still in school? Yes. Was he planning to go to college in the fall of uh, 2014? Yes. And what were his plans? Uh, to take business at Fitchburg State. And what was the reason that he was interested in business? Um, <clears throat> to run his father's company someday. And so he continued, even though he was graduating high school, to have he knew that were there? Yes. Who was that? His best friend, Tom. What was Tom's last name? Gamel. How did he know Tom Gamble? Uh, he's been friends with them since they were young. Did they play baseball together? Yes. Are you still married to uh, Conrad Jr.? No. When uh, did you divorce him? Um, about six years ago. So sometime in the time frame of 2011, 2012? Mm-hmm. Yes. And at that time when uh, you were divorced, were what were the living arrangements? Where were you living and where were the children living? At the time of our divorce? Yes. Uh, we were living together and we were getting separated. So at the time, uh, how old would Conrad have been uh, when you were 16. Were... Did you notice any change in Conrad uh, at age 16 when uh, you and your husband then were talking about divorce? Yes, he um, was sad about it, like most children. Um, from a product of divorce. And when you say he was sad, did he do anything uh, to harm himself or say he was going to do anything to harm himself because of that? No. Did he continue to go to school and do the activities that he normally would do? Yes. At some point, did you move out of the familial home? Yes. And where was that? What, what, what was the location that the family was living at prior I'm to? Yeah. What was the address? Uh, three Perkins Lane. And so when there was a break, where did you go to live or where did your husband go to live? I rented a house in Marion. And what uh, was the, really, what was the um, arrangement with your ex-husband with regards to the children? We, had, we have joint custody. So would the children spend half the time with you and half the time with their father? Correct. Did you notice any change in Conrad with that arrangement? Um, he had a bit of anxiety. Uh, he had trouble sleeping. And was that something that he had uh, prior to the divorce or was that something that you saw that was as exasperated by the divorce? It was exasperated. And as a result of seeing that, did you uh, do something to try to help him with that? Yes. And I want to take a step back. Are, uh, do you, are you employed? Yes. What type of work do you do? I'm a nurse. And how long have you been a nurse? Uh, over 10 years. Getting back to the uh, original question, what did you do uh, when you noticed that there was some anxiety and some sleeping issues with Conrad? I went to a Boston Children's Hospital 2011, September, with um, my ex-husband's aunt, Barbara. And why did you uh, elect to go there? Um, because she was familiar with the hospital. And the aunt Barbara, was she in the medical or, or the? Yes, she's a nurse. Okay. And at the time uh, when you went in 2000, September of 2011, was, what was the result? Uh, they put him in a Bornwood partial um, hospitalization. Okay. And do you recall where Bornwood Hospital was? It's in Brookline, Mass. Was he, um, was that an inpatient thing or something he would go in and come home? Yeah, it was a partial day program. Okay, mm -hmm. so it wasn't anything where he had to stay overnight? No. Uh, do you know whether or not he was prescribed any medication at that time? I, no, I believe he wasn't taking <clears throat> anything. And when he was in that partial day program, um, did he, did you see any improvement? Yes. And was he in school at that time? Um, he was at Rochester. And what year would he have been in? Um, I believe a sophomore. Okay. At some point, did you change him from Old Rochester to a different school? Yes. And what school did he then go uh, to? Bishop Stang. 
What was the reason for the change? Um, I just thought because it was a smaller school and spiritual, it would help. Um, it would just be better for him. And you, when the smaller school would have been Bishop Stang? Yes. Did he actually attend there? Yes. How long did he attend there? Uh, for a few weeks. And um, was he exhibiting any signs while he was there that concerned you? Yes. What was that? Um, he just didn't feel well around others. He had social anxiety. Um, and social anxiety, uh, you said you're a nurse. Could you tell us what that means? <clears throat> I suppose the way I'm feeling right now, <laughs> talking in front of um, others. He had trouble talking in front of other people about his thoughts, feelings. Did you and consider him to be kind of a reserved and quiet boy? Yes, absolutely. And after those few weeks at uh, Bishop Stang, what did he do next? Um, we decided that he would work with his father full time uh, for at least the rest of the year. So he took a, the rest of the year off? Yes. And this would be his sophomore year in high school? Yes. And how was he feeling? Uh, what was his reaction when he learned that he was going to be working with his dad? He was looking forward to it. And Ms. Roy, just for my clarification, what year are we talking about now that he went to Stang and went to work for his father? What year? Yes, ma'am. Um, it was 2011. 2011. Okay, yes. thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Captain. No problem. So from the school year of 2011 until the school year of 2012, he would have been working with his dad? Yes. And how often would he go to work with his dad? Every day. And when he was working with his dad, would he also um, stay at his father's house on occasion as well? Yes. Where was his bedroom? He had his own bedroom. Where? At his dad's house. And what about at your house? Yeah, he had his own bedroom. So he had a bedroom at both parents' homes? Yes. Did you ever go to Florida? Yes. And uh, do you recall what year he went to Florida? I believe it was 2012. Okay. And where specifically did he go? Uh, to Naples, Florida. Did you go on the trip? No, I did not. Who went? Uh, he went with his father and his sisters and uh, Carolyn. Okay. And Carolyn was your uh, ex-husband's girlfriend? Yes. Now, do you know, what was the reason that the your ex-husband and the kids were going to Florida? They were visiting um, his aunt that lives in Naples, Florida. So Conrad's father's aunt lived in Naples, Florida? And was it a vacation? Yeah, them? she lives there from December to April. Okay. Did you, um, after that, if, uh, after February of 2012, did you come to know that Conrad had met somebody down in Florida? I heard that he met someone. And uh, who did you hear that from? Uh, his sister, Camden. Okay. And what was the name of the person? Michelle. Did you know her last name? Cotter. And was that the first time you'd ever heard that name? Yes. Had you ever spoken to her at that time frame? No. Did you hear much about Michelle Carter in 2012 or 2013? No. Did you know uh, if Conrad had a girlfriend during that time period? He did have a girlfriend, but it was not her. Who was it? Catherine. And do you know Catherine's last name? Ball. And when would that relationship have been? Uh, 2014, 2013, 2014. Did he have... Um, and he had other relationships before. I just... Okay. Did he have, a, 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 in the time frame of 2012, did he have someone that he had met in Michigan? Yes. And who was that? I don't remember her name. Okay. And was that a person that he would actually see? No. And what was the nature of their relationship, if you um, know? I, I just know that he met her on online or okay. somehow. Did he have any plans, if you know, to go visit her? He was. I talked to her dad on the phone um, at one night for a while. And when was, we he, just, when was he going to visit her? Uh, it was summer of 2012. Okay. And did those plans fall through? Yes. Why? Um, well, her dad and I both discussed that it was, um, she had um, issues with an eating disorder and we both uh, agreed that it would probably not be best that they um, were together. Okay. Or and was uh, Conrad upset about that? He was uh, a little, yeah, he was a little let down. So in your knowledge, did he ever meet this person from Michigan? No. Did you observe a change in him after that breakup in uh, September of 2012? 
Um, or summer of 2012? Not so much. Okay. So now, September of 2012, the start of his junior, junior year, was he going to school? He was taking computer classes. Okay. And this was at what school now? Old Rochester. Now, when you say he was taking computer classes, what was the reason that he wasn't enrolled full time? Um, I believe he started back up full time, and then he w he started getting anxious in the classroom. So and again, social anxiety. Mm -hmm. Do you recall whether or not in September of 2012 he was on any medications? No. Do you recall whether or not he was either seeing someone for counseling or therapy? Yes. And uh, do you recall who that was? Um, there was different doctors. I know he saw a Dr. Schwartz at one point. I can't recall the other names. Was he playing sports during that time? Yes. And what, what was he doing? He was playing baseball. Did he also enjoy rowing? Yes. When did he start up with rowing? I'm not certain on the date. Okay. Uh, but I believe it was uh, introduced to him um, around the time that his father was with his girlfriend. Okay. So. And at that time in 2013, was he still living part-time with you and part-time with his dad? Yes. <coughs> Where primarily was he staying? In 2013. Uh, with both of us. Okay. Was he still working with his dad? Yes. Now that fall in October, midpoint of October of 2012, did he have any reoccurring issues with either uh, depression or social anxiety that you became aware of? I'm sorry, when? Uh, October of 2012. Yes. And what do you recall about that? I just remember him um, <coughs> feeling really down and having these recent thoughts. Um, I believe it was September 2012, he went to the ER. Okay. And can you tell us about that? How did you find out that he, did you bring him to the ER? Uh, um, his dad, I brought him on October 3rd, okay. 2012. But you're talking previous that but September? Bef yeah, before that okay. he went into the hospital, I believe. I'm just going to ask you to keep your voice up nice and loud for us. So you said that you brought him to uh, either a hospital in October of 2012? October 3rd. And which hospital did you bring him to? Uh, St. Luke's. And what was the reason for that? Because he was having suicidal thoughts. And did he say that to you? Yes. What did he tell you? Um, having these racing thoughts, they're not good thoughts, they're bad thoughts. So. And after he told you about that, you sought help for him? Of course. And he went with you? Yes. Was he then, after you brought him to the hospital, was he then, uh, did he go back to Bournemouth? No, he, no, he was, uh, then he was at um, Arba Fuller. Okay. That and was his first hos ho inpatient hospitalization. <coughs> and do you recall where Arba Fuller was? Uh, in Attleboro. Okay. And how long did he stay at Arba Fuller? Uh, about a week. And did you visit him during that time? Yes. And how would you describe, did his uh, demeanor change or his outlook change while he was at Arbor Fuller? He seemed, he seemed like he was getting uh, better treatment. Okay. And did he get prescribed any medications that you know of at Arbor Fuller? Um, I don't recall. And after he stayed that week, did he go back to resume his schoolwork? He did, but then he had another um, incident. It was maybe 10 days after, and his father brought him to Toby ER, and then that's when he was admitted to Bournewood. That was his first inpatient hospitalization at Bournewood okay. in Brookline. And this would have been uh, around October 27th of 2012? Yes. And when you said his, uh, his first attempt, what do you mean by that? Um, he, that was his first in, um, inpatient at Bournewood, okay. 2012. And he had first gone to Toby Hospital? Yes. 
And what was the reason that he went, why did he need to go to Toby Hospital? His father brought him. Uh, he wasn't feeling well. Okay. And I know it's very hard to ask you to pinpoint specific dates, but I'm going to ask you if you recall um, either receiving some information on October 27, 2012, about um, Conrad <coughs> and the emergency 911 being called. Okay. Do you recall that? Yes. What do you recall? Where were you when you received some information about that? Uh, I, I was in my car. Okay. Uh, Where was he staying that on that day, the 26th of October? He was at his dad's house. And who did you get a call from? Um, the EM EMT. Okay. Had you gotten a call officer. from anybody in your family before that? Your mom or anybody? Um, my mom did say that she saw him at, uh, at Walmart getting Sorry, mom said what, please? She saw him earlier at Walmart. Okay. But this was after I got the call. Oh, okay. So. so when you're driving, you get a call, and it's um, EMTs? Yes. Tell us what happened. Um, they said that they found him there, and it looked like he took some substance, uh, I don't know, Tylenol or something. Um, so I got there right away. When you say there, where did you go? To uh, Perkins Lane. When you arrived at Perkins Lane, did you see any emergency apparatus, any ambulances? Uh, the EMTs were there. Where was your son? He was sitting on the chair. Um, they, they told me that he had just uh, thrown up and it was just all red. Um, they asked if I would want him to be treated, and I said absolutely and he was sent to uh, Toby Hospital. And did Conrad agree to go to Toby Hospital? Oh, yes. And from Toby Hospital, was he transferred somewhere else? Yes. Where did he go? Children's Hospital. What was the reason that he needed to be transferred to Children's? Because his acetaminophen levels were so high. And would that be taking, uh, would that be uh, as a result of ingesting Tylenol? Yes. Did you talk to him about that? Why he did that? Of course I did. What did he say? Um, he just didn't know. He couldn't really. He couldn't really answer. He just wasn't feeling well, and he said he was sorry. Did you find out that he had told somebody that he had done that? Yes. And what did you learn about that? Okay. That. Just staying. <clears throat> that that person. No, you don't have to answer the question. You, you need to answer. Wait for another question, please. Okay. When. Um, he was transferred to Boston Children's Hospital. How long did he stay there? Um, for about four days. Did you visit him? What yes. was his demeanor like when he was at Boston Children's? He was scared. Um, he told me he would never do that again to me. Did he like, did he uh, mind staying in the hospital setting? <laughs> of course he did. He didn't like it at all. Um, he thought he was, he didn't like be, being like different like that. He, you know, he, he knew that he had a lot of um, family and support, friends, people that loved him. He knew that he had a great future ahead of him, but he just could not stop these thoughts in his head and it was making him so, so depressed. Did he think that the hospital settings and these inpatients helped him? Um, for a little bit, but long term, no. When he uh, <clears throat> was released from Boston Children's Hospital, did he go back into another uh, stay at Bournewood? Yes. And this would be, um, is it the same? Let me ask you this. When he first went to Bournewood, what division was he in? Did they have different divisions there? He was with the children the first time, and then the psychiatrist thought he was developing relationships with the younger kids, so they put him in with strictly adults, and he was 17 at the time. So. And this would have been um, October 30th into November of 2012? Um, around that time, yes. And what was his reaction when he was now placed with older people in that setting? Conrad was very laid back. He never complained. Um, he just t took whatever was given to him. So he really didn't complain much. He did the best he could. Um, he was still having trouble sleeping. Uh, I demanded that the psychiatrist sit with him for a while, and um, and that's when he was put on Seroquel. 
That was the first time he was put on Seroquel. Do you know if he was put on any other medication at that time? Um, I, I believe uh, Trazodone also. And possibly Celexa. And the Trazodone, uh, what would that be prescribed for? Uh, sleep. <clears throat> and the Celexa? The Celexa for his depression. Do you know whether or not he was um, compliant in taking his medications? He was. And when he was discharged in November of 2012 from um, his second stay in Bournemouth, did he once again resume going to school? Um, when he got released that time? Yes. yes. And where did he go at that point? He went to Old Rochester. And was there something called a gateway program where they could work part-time and go to school? Yeah, did that's he what that? he did. So what was his schedule like? I'm not positive his schedule. I can't recall okay. the, the days that he was at school and um, working with dad. And did he ever express any concern with you about not wanting to go work with his dad? No. Do you know if he was continuing counseling in uh, that time frame, November into January of 2013? Um, he was seeing a counselor in Mattapoiset. I'm not certain on the dates. Keeping the time focused on January of 2003 now, up until that point, had you ever heard the name Michelle Carter other than the time when uh, the girls came back from Florida? Um, I know that he went to see, he went with Camden to uh, her grandmother's funeral. Do you recall what date that would have been? No. Did you ever see her around either your house or, or here Conrad Shane was going to visit her? Just, I think once he told me um, in my, he is my car. Did you consider that she was somebody that was uh, close to him at that time? I just knew that she was a family friend, that's all I knew. Please keep your voice up just a bit. Okay. Were there any other hospitalizations in the year of 2013? No. And did Conrad ever express to you that he was suicidal? No. Was he still uh, playing sports in 2013, the spring and summertime? Yes. And what was he doing at that time? He played baseball um, in the summer, and he still rode. Was he close to his sisters? Very much. Did he like to socialize outside of his family? Yes, of course. How would he be around strangers? He, he had anxiety. Um, it was not easy for him to talk to strangers or make conversations. He tr uh, had trouble with that. At some point, did he go, uh, after he'd been accepted to Fitchburg, did he actually go there to see Tom and kind of check out the campus? He did. And. Um, was he planned on staying there for some period of time? Yes. And what happened? Um, I remember our conversations through text message, and he showed me uh, pictures of the bedroom and what he put on the wall, and he was really excited. He got food for the apartment, sheets, everything. Um, and then he told me a story about a boy throwing a brick through his mother's car window or something, and I said, well, you can always go back to your roots, because Fitchburg is a little noisier than Mount Apoiset. Um, I remember having that conversation that you can always start a family someday back your roots in Mount Apoiset. And um, I just remember him texting me one of the nights, and he was like, hey, Mom, can we talk? He'd always say that, hey, Mom, can we talk? Um, Um, sorry. Uh, he just said that he wasn't, it was hard, he was, it was hard to develop, um, relate, thank you, relationships with, uh, the, the, the other kids there. Um, he just had a hard time. When you, you know. when you told him that he could always come back to his roots, was that something that he felt comfort in? Of course. He liked spending time on the water with his family. Yes. He liked being with his family. 
Was he someone that when he was with you and uh, at your home, did he go out frequently on the weekends or at night? No. No. Mm -hmm. Did he have uh, a cell phone? Yes. And mm -hmm. how would you describe his uh, activity with a cell phone? Uh, I don't know. Is it more activity than me? So he would text a lot, like most teenagers, and on Twitter or Facebook or... What about computers? Did he have access to computers? Yes. What kind of a computer did he have? He had a laptop. Um, <coughs> and he had our uh, family computer. And stepping back to the uh, time that he was up at Fitchburg, did he eventually uh, leave Fitchburg? Yes, he said he wanted to come home, um, and I said, that's fine. And when was that that he left Fitchburg and came back to Mattapoise? It was in June. So how long would he have been up there? Uh, he wasn't even there more than a few days. And this would be June of 2014? Yes. The computer that you mentioned, uh, at some point did you turn those over to the police? Yes. Prior to 2014, did you ever see or meet Michelle Carter? Yes. Where was that? At uh, his baseball game in Marion, 2013. And let's talk about that. When you saw her, um, were you introduced to her? Yes. And who introduced you? Uh, she did. She introduced herself to me. And what did she tell you? I'm Michelle. Did you have any understanding at that point whether or not she was uh, just a friend or more than a friend? I just thought it was a friend that he liked. Okay. Do you see Michelle Carter present in the courtroom today? Yes. Could you please point to her, identify something that she's wearing? I don't know. A red shirt. Looks Your like. record reflect identification of the defendant. Yes, the uh, record will so reflect. Thank you. So in 2013, what was your understanding of the relationship between the defendant and Michelle Carter? I thought they were just friends. They live far away, so. Where do you know, or where did you, where did she live? Uh, Plainville. Over that uh, period of time, did you ever know that they were in communication by either social media or texting? Yeah, I saw him text her all the time. And how do you know it was her that he was texting? Because I saw Michelle Carter on his phone. And we, when was that that you saw him texting her? Uh, often it was a couple of months before he died. Did he ever talk to you about his relationship with her, say in, in uh, 2014, did he ever talk about her? No, not at all. In 2014, did he ever express to you any intent to harm himself? No. I'm going to direct your attention now to July of 2014. Where were you living at that time? I was in Fairhaven. And at that point, was Comrade still splitting his time between you and his dad? Yes. Where did he sleep at the house in Fairhaven? He slept in the bedroom. Was he working at the time? Yes. Where was he working? With his dad. Has he ever not worked with his father? Uh, maybe for a week here and there. That's about it. In um, July of 2014, did you have any concerns about his mental health? I knew he was a little depressed, but I thought he was, he was doing great. I mean, he just, you know, graduated from high school, got his captain's license, and I thought everything was moving forward, not backwards. And did you get that sense from him? Yes. Do you know if he was in counseling in that period, June of 2014? June, I know, 2014? I know um, one of the days we looked at our, what counselors were in the area with our insurance. I know that he went to see um, someone in Fall River. Okay. It was about in June, May, June. Um, 2014. And he discussed with you that he wanted to go and see someone? Yes. And did he say why? He actually wanted to go see a cognitive behavioral therapist. That was his goal. But um, Why did he want to see a cognitive behavioral therapist? He thought maybe that person would, I don't know, kind of change his way of thinking. 
Um, did he think he had problems with his memory? Yes. What did he say about that? He just said, I feel like I have memory loss a lot of times, and evidently he did not. Um, I think it was just his anxiety that uh, made him feel that way. In that time frame where he mentioned that he wanted to go see someone, uh, did you learn whether or not he was on medication at that time, June, July of 2014? Yeah, he started taking his Celexa again and Trazodone, I believe. And how do you know those medications that he was taking? Um, he told me. In June, did he ever mention he wanted to harm himself? No. When you mentioned that he had a computer, um, did you have a computer in your home? Yes. And what type of computer was that? Yeah, it's an Apple iMac. Did he have access to that? Yes. And the laptop that he had, did he use that at your home? Yes. Did you ever see him in June or July searching for uh, suicide websites or anything like that? No. And at that time in uh, the summer of 2014, who was he friendly with? In the summer of 2014? Yes. Um, girlfriends, boyfriends? No, just regular I mean, friends. Who, what group of kids would he hang around with? Uh, he spent a lot of time with Ariana. And what's Ariana's last name? Taylor. And Louie. I'm sorry, the second name? Louie. Louie, yeah. And um, Tom. Gamma. Tom? Did any of his friends ever express to you that they had concerns about his mental health? No. Again, that uh, first few weeks of July, say July 1st, up until your son passed away, did you ever um, talk to Michelle Carter? No. I'm going to direct your attention to July 12th of 2014. That was the last day you saw your son. What did you do that day? Oh, <clears throat> the girls wanted to go to the speech in Westport, and um, he wanted to come with us. Had um, you seen him um, that morning, well, let me ask you this. What time was it that the plan was to go He was to with me that morning. He was with me the night before. And so the night before would have been on the, the 11th of July? The 12th, the 11th, yes. What was he, what was he doing um, at your home the 11th of July? We just, um, we made dinner and he was there with us and he slept home that night. Did you see him on his phone texting? He was always doing that. And so now, uh, the morning hours of July 12, 2014, what's the plan and uh, what time is it that you go to the beach? I know, we went late. Um, I don't know, he went to his dad's house to get his bathing suit. Okay, so he had clothing still at his dad's house. And yes. in order to go to the beach, he had to go to his dad's house to get his bathing suit. Mm -hmm. How was his demeanor on that day? It was fine. I uh, didn't feel like he was, anything was unusual. Um, Did you see him with any, well, let me ask you this. When he went to his dad's house, uh, what kind of a car was he driving? His truck. What kind of a, a truck did he drive? It's a Ford, I believe, 250. What color? Diesel, black. The diesel truck? Very loud. Mm -hmm. And did you ever go in his truck? Um, yeah, he took me to work a few times. Okay. Um, that summer before he passed. Did you ever see any uh, generators or water pumps or anything in his truck when you were driving with him? No. Those types of equipment, water pumps and, and generators, was those something that his uh, father's tugboat business would have? Yes. So after he came back from his dad's uh, with his bathing suit, did you all go to the beach? Yeah, we went to get um, Morgan's friend, Natalie, uh, we picked her up and then her mother was going to meet us there. Afterwards, we stopped at Stop and Shop and I think it was the f probably the very first time that my son was eating guacamole, which I told him it was delicious and got these little, and he really liked it. He was eating tortilla chips and guacamole on the way to the beach. 
and both of his sisters were with him? Yes. And a friend named Natalie? Yes. What uh, car were you all in when you went to the beach? Uh, we took my boyfriend's car. How long did you stay at the beach? We probably got there around noontime, one. We probably stayed until almost four. And during that time, uh, were you constantly in Conrad's presence? Yeah, we took a long walk on the beach. What did you talk about? Life, what was going to happen. What did you say? Kind of laugh. You know, we made some jokes. Some people on the beach were wearing <clears throat> little bathing suits, and we were kind of joking about that. Um, was he laughing? Mm -hmm. What was he saying about um, what was going to happen in the future? I just asked him about school, and he says, I'm not sure, Mom, right now, about you know how I feel right now. I said, well, it really doesn't matter. You got your captain's license. You can work with Dad until you figure things out. Everything doesn't have to happen. You, know, you don't have to worry about anything. Now, when you were walking with him on the beach, um, did he ever express that he wanted to harm himself? No. From the time, uh, from noon time till about four, uh, did you ever see him uh, using his phone while he was at the beach? Yeah, he asked me to go sit in his in the car, and I'm like, Conrad, why would you want to? It's so warm out, and why would you want to do that? Um, so we went to, because I guess there was no reception on the beach, so he wanted to leave and go into the parking lot. I didn't think. I mean, hey, you know, kids, teenagers want their phones with them all the time, so. How long do you think that he was up in the parking lot area? Well, my friend Jody, when she came to meet us at the beach, she saw him in the parking lot on his phone. So he was probably gone for maybe half hour. Okay. And then he came back and uh, sat down and Morgan went to get some clam cakes. And that was the last thing that I, I shared with him that we ate together. And so then you left the beach? Yeah, we left the beach, and then uh, the girls wanted to get ice cream at a place <laughs> nearby, and the line was so, so long. Um, so I asked him, I said, when we get back, could you take them for ice cream for me? What um, did he say? He did. Did he, he seem happy? He, was f he seemed fine, yeah. I gave him my credit card, and he took my car, and he got them um, whatever they wanted, and Camden told me he had a hot dog and a lime murky. What yeah. car did they go in to go to the ice cream? I had a Volvo station wagon. Okay. What time did they come home from uh, having ice cream? Uh, must have been around 5.30, so. And this is now 5.30 on July 12th, Saturday evening? Yes. What were, the, what were your plans for that night? I just had a few people come over. We didn't really have any plans. My boyfriend was making dinner for all of us. Okay. And at some point uh, after 5.30, did Conrad leave the home? He did. What did he tell you? When, when he was sitting there, he was, my boyfriend made a joke with him about, you know, something, and he was smiling. And maybe a half hour later, I remember I was standing in the kitchen um, at the sink, and I turned, and he said, Mom, I'm going to go to Ariana's. And I said, are you going to be back for dinner? He's like, no, I don't think so. I said, well, all right, I'll just let me know what your plans are later. And, and that was it. That I was left. the last time you saw him? Mm -hmm. What time did you leave? I want to say it was a little around 6 o'clock. And when he left, how did he, what did he leave in? I think he just had a T-shirt and shorts. No, I mean, what kind of vehicle? Oh, his truck. Did you see him take anything with him when he left? No. Did you try to contact him later that night? Yes. And what time was that? Um, it was after t t 10. 10 p.m.? Yeah. And how did you try to contact him? I just out texted him and I asked him, when do you think, he's, when do you think you're going to be home? Did he reply to your text? No. Was that normal for him? Um, at times, I mean, if he was, you know, with his friends and just, you know. And what made you text him at that time? 
wanting to know where he was or when he was coming home? Um, because Camden got a text message from uh, Michelle. And how did you learn about that? Camden told me, she's like, I don't know what to say, Mom, because he's at Ariana's, and Michelle is saying that they're boyfriend and girlfriend now, and I don't know what to say, and I said, well, just say that he's at Dad's house, because you know how girls get, they get jealous. Was that the um, truth? I'm sorry? Was that the truth that he was at his dad's house? No, he was at Ariana's. That's what he told you? That's what he told me. Did you ever hear from Conrad that night? My son? Yes. No. So at 5 a.m., directing your attention to around 5 a.m. the next morning, which is now July 13th, 2014. I texted him again in the middle of the night. What time? I want to say it was about 1.30. I woke up. I had probably fallen asleep around 11. I woke up around 1.30 and it, his truck wasn't there. And that was not like him to not. The week before, he, he had a, like a fire with Ariana. And I think he came home at like 2 in the morning. So that's why I wasn't very um, shocked. But he wasn't, he never not came home. So when you woke up and saw that his truck wasn't there at 1 a.m., you texted him? And did you get any response? I just said, um, I, I, te I don't know if it was at that moment, that time, 5.30 or whatever, but I, I just got in the car with Holly. Holly was just my dog. She's Conrad's dog. She's a couple, she was two months. I got, I got her in May, she, so two months. She was a couple of months old. She was born in March, so I just she was just so small, and I just put her in the car, and we went by Ariana's, and his truck wasn't there. Okay, I we're called. Ask you to keep your voice up so we can hear you. So wait, I just want to make sure that we have the time frame right. So you texted him at one because his truck wasn't there, and then you went back to sleep and you woke up at five, mm -hmm. and you took the dog, put him, put her in the car, and where did you go? I drove by Ariana's. And where did Ariana live at that time? She lives in Rochester. Uh, and what was the reason that you were driving by Ariana's? I wanted to see where, if his truck was there. And what happened when you drove by Ariana's? His truck wasn't there. What did you do next? I didn't have her phone number, so I, um, I called his dad and um, I asked him, I said, I'm freaking out. I don't know where Co is. I don't, and he said, um, well, check my house because I'm not here, like, you know. So I went by his house, he wasn't there. And, so you um, went by his dad's house? Yeah, so he finally got me Ariana's phone number and I, so she came over to the house, she helped me look for him. Um, where were the girls, your girls at this point? They were, they were in Fairhaven with me. The, they wanted to go to Waterwiz for the day and I said, I can't, I don't know where your brother is, I can't take you. Um, so we ended up taking them in the morning, but that was, I got in touch with the uh, Mattapoise and the Fairhaven police officer. And I, want to, I want to slow you slow down right here. What time, uh, first of all, which police department did you call first? Mattapoise. And what was the reason for that? Because he lived in Mount Poison. And after, uh, what did you tell them? I just told him I, I can't find my son. And he said, well, given the circumstance um, prior of his first suicide attempt, um, they said they'll, you know, then, because he was 18 at the time. So they didn't feel like uh, they, they should um, look for an 18 year old. So. And did they ask you how long you've been missing? Uh, they, to they told me to, I don't remember if I told them, but they told me to direct it to the Fairhaven Police Department. Did you do that? Yes. <clears throat> and do you recall uh, about what time on the 13th that you called the Fairhaven Police? I don't know, maybe 10.30 in the morning. At some point did a Fairhaven officer come to your home and yes. speak with you? And without getting into the conversation, you told them essentially what your concerns were? Yes. And did you give them a description of your son? Yes. And a description of the vehicle? Yes. Did you have his license plate number? Did you know his registration? No, I did not. No, at the time, did you know? No. Did you make any attempt to contact uh, Michelle Carter at that point? Um, at that point, I'm not sure. Um, I think some, some, how throughout the day I did. Do you recall either getting any communication with her, either text messages or uh, 
on the 13th from Michelle Carter? Yes. I'm going to go over a couple of those with you if I could, please. I'm going to direct your attention to what's um, 229. Um, the date being July 13th, 2014. It's uh, the second one from the bottom. You see 239. Hi, just checking in. Any news? Do you recall that text message? Yes. And that's to you from Michelle Carter. Later on that day at 8.13 p.m., a text message from a Michelle Carter. You see it there, number two. Yes. I'm so very sorry. Conrad meant so much to me, and he was loved by so many. If you and your family need anything, please let me know. I can come by tomorrow to help comfort you. If you need it, please keep in touch. You're in my thoughts and prayers. He will forever be in all of our hearts. Do you recall receiving that? Yes. Do you recall getting any information from Michelle Carter about where your son was? No. Do you recall getting any information about Michelle Carter that she had been in touch with your son that night? No. And 8.17, a text message to you from Michelle Carter. He was such a bright light, such a beautiful soul. Please stay strong. We are all here for you and your family. He was an amazing son because he had such an amazing mother. I will talk to you soon, Michelle. You recall that? Yes. Yes. She continues to text you. Uh, is that true? Yes. And that's throughout July, August, yes. September. On July 15th, this is now after you've been told about your son's death. How did you first come to learn that your son had passed away? How did I learn? How did you, how did you find out? Uh, my ex-husband called me. And what were your, uh, what did you learn? Did it, he just told me that it's, uh, are you with the girls right now? I said, yeah. I said, why? He's like, it's just. There's yellow tape around a son's truck. Did he tell you where the truck was located? Yes. Where was it? In a parking lot, a Kmart parking lot in Fairhaven. And at some point, did they tell you what was found inside his truck? Yes. What was that? Before? No. On July 16th, 2014, text number 235. Do you recall getting this from Michelle Carter? Thank you for sending me this. It's a wonderful obituary. I will be there for you for both the services and look forward to seeing you and meeting more of your family. I hope you are doing OK. We are all here for you with endless love and support. Stay strong for him and your beautiful girls. They need you more than ever. I will see you Friday. Do you recall that? Yes. And what did you send her? What did I send her back? Right. Did you send her an obituary or? Yeah, the picture of him, his card um, from the funeral, at this funeral point, home. At this point, had what was your understanding of their relationship? I, I just know that they met years ago, so I don't, I mean, they were teenagers and they liked each other. And you didn't know that prior to receiving these text messages? That they were boyfriend and girlfriend? Not until July 12th when she told Camden. Do you recall receiving a text message to her, uh, I'm sorry, to you from her on <laughs> July 16th of 2014 at 10.41 p.m.? I love you. There's no need to thank me. I'm always here for you. Did you think it was odd that she was asking or telling you that she loved you? No, I, I just yeah. believe that she felt Jane, me. the answer is stricken. <coughs> Had you ever met her at that point other than at that, at that baseball game? No. On July 16, 2014, at 11.26 p.m., do you recall getting a text message from Michelle Carter where she says, see you soon, be strong? Yes. And on the 19th of July, this would be after, when were Conrad services? Uh, the 19th. Did she attend? Uh, I believe so. Yeah. Do you recall seeing her there? 
I recall seeing her at the wake. Who was she with? Her mother. Did she approach you or speak to you at all? Yes. What did she do? She just introduced me to her mom. Did she say anything to you about how she had been talking with Conrad on July 12th? No. Did she ever mention she was speaking to him at all? Uh, maybe a week beforehand. That she was speaking to him a week beforehand? Yes. Did she ever say to you that she had any idea of what he was talking about or what his thought process was? No. And in July uh, 19th, that 2014 text at 9.54 p.m., this is after the services, <coughs> she texts you, you were so strong today, the services were so beautiful, I wish he knew how many people loved him. May all of our love and support keep you warm and strong. We love you, Lynn. I'll be over soon. I'll stay in touch. Do you recall that? Yes. At some point after uh, the services for your son, did you have to get away with the girls? Um, they were afraid to be around me, so I went away for the weekend um, with them. Why were they afraid to be around you? Okay. Did you take them somewhere for a trip, like to get away from what was going on? Yes. Where did you go? To Maine. And while you were in Maine, was the defendant still in contact with you? Yes. Do you recall her sending you a text message on July 24th of 2014 when she says, and this is uh, number 213, oh, that's awesome. I'm happy you got to go there but I know how hard it must be, but just know that there, because he isn't there with you physically, he is still there in spirit. He's all around you all the time. He's the ocean waves and the shining sun, the wild wind and the pouring rain. He is always with you by your side. Just because you can't see him doesn't mean he's not there with you. He will always be with you. You are doing an amazing job staying strong for your girls. They love you and are looking up to you in this difficult time. They know that they have an incredibly strong mother. I'd love some pictures. Do you recall that? Yes. Did she also tell you that same text time frame at 7.06? Whenever you start to miss him, go to the ocean and look out across the water. No matter how far away in heaven he may be, the ocean is what will always bring you together. Do you yes. recall that? At 7.55, again on July 24th, from Michelle Carter to you, do you recall this message? You're beautiful, Lynn. I love you, too, and I'll always be here to support you and love you and give you all the words you need to hear to help you through this. I'm always going to be here for you. He did deserve the world. He deserved the best of everything. He was the most beautiful person I ever knew. I thought he was just the greatest man. Do you recall that? Yes. And at that point, had she ever mentioned anything about what she had been saying to Conrad Roy? No. On 7.25, text number 206, at 6.24 p.m., to recall this text message from Michelle Carter to you. Lynn, I never want to hear you say that. You did not fail him, not even a little bit. You tried your hardest. I tried my hardest. Everyone tried their hardest to save him. But he on taking his life. There was nothing anyone could do to save him, no matter how hard they tried. I never tried harder at something in my life. He was the most important person in the world to me. I saw my life with him. I wish things could be so different now, too. But you need to know that this is not your fault. It's hard to believe it now, and it may be for a while. But it's something that you need to let yourself accept and believe, or else you will never truly live again. If anything, it's my fault and it's something I'll never forgive myself for. But we have each other and everyone else to help us through this. I will love you and support you forever. You are not alone. Do you recall that? Yes. And these messages again continue into July 26 of 2014. Does she tell you at some point or do you learn that she's going to organize a baseball tournament in honor of your son? Yes. And in a text message on July 26 at 10.34 a.m., do you recall receiving this from Michelle Carter? I so want to organize a baseball softball tournament in honor of Conrad because he loved the Red Sox and played baseball and loved the game, as you know. I know people always 
uh, do walks and stuff to raise awareness and remember someone, but I want to do a baseball tournament and it will be in his honor. I came up with the name of Homers for Conrad and the money will go to a suicide prevention awareness organization I found. And for every home run hit, I was thinking maybe some money would go to a scholarship that you made in his honor. That would be a cool little addition. What do you think? Do you recall that? Yes. And again, has she ever mentioned anything about what she'd been saying to Conrad? No. On July 26, 2014, text number 193, 10.54 a.m. Do you recall receiving this from Michelle Carter? I understand, oh, well, yes, I am very passionate about this idea. I also want to raise awareness as best I can because I don't want to have any other family or person to suffer from losing a loved one to mental illness. I did some research and I found a ball field in your town with four fields that would be perfect. And then she goes on. She also talks about having it potentially in her hometown of Plainville. Is that true? Yes. Did she or did you ever mention to her that Conrad had written a suicide letter to her? Ah, uh, yes. What did you tell her about that? I read it to her over the phone after he died. Where did you find it? Or did you find it? Yeah, it was in a notebook. At, um, it was either my house or dad's house. And uh, when you read this letter to her over the phone, what was her reaction? She just kept asking me um, throughout the summer if she could get that note. And what did you do with the note? I, I had to give evidence to the police, everything that he used. Did you understand why the police were asking you for those items? Objection. No. A rule. I'm sorry, you can answer. No. Did she begin, um, after you read that letter, did she begin asking you constantly for it? Yes. And did you tell her why you couldn't give it to her? Yes. What did you tell her? I don't know, it was just a routine, um, just a routine thing, that, um, just because he was, he died in an open area. Okay. Do you recall receiving a text message, this is uh, text number 182, on August 4, 2014, 3.37 p.m., sent by Michelle Carter to your phone. That's expected understanding that you still have been able to find peace. Everyone knows how difficult this process is for you, but we are all here for support and comfort. I know how hard being around people, but it's actually a good thing to try to ease into. You can't stay in your house and think about it. You need to get out and live your life. That's what Conrad would have wanted for you. So whenever you're ready, take it day by day, and I will probably come Wednesday to go through some of those things, and I can come back for the letter whenever you get it. Do you recall that? Yes. That same day now, uh, text number 178, 531. Just know that he doesn't want you to be like this. I know it's the hardest thing you've ever had to deal with and something you do not deserve to deal with. And I know I don't, I know the pain you're in, but I know that Conrad doesn't want you to live this way. He would want you to live your life and keep him in your heart. But instead of crying when you think of him, smile instead. Because he's always watching over you. He will really, he will never really be gone. Live the best life you can for him. All he wants is for you to be happy, or at least try to be. And I understand that was a good decision to bring his stuff to his dad's. Just let me know. Do you recall that? Yes. On August 4th, 2014, at 5.48 p.m., text number 172, do you recall receiving this? I loved him, Lynn. I thought he was the most extraordinary person, and I know I'm young, but I saw the rest of my life with him, and he told me the same. He was the bright light of my life, and I'm so great, grateful and blessed for the little infinity he gave me, and knowing him was the best thing that ever happened to me. I just thought he was the greatest man, so special and kind. I adored him, and I loved him so much, He's your angel now, and he will always be by your side. We will carry him in our hearts forever, and you, your life may not be the same, but maybe you can make something of it. Use this as, use it as strength and health for others. Do you recall that? Yes.
Do you recall on August 6, text number 156 at 11.29 a.m., a text message from Michelle Carter's phone to you? Council, are these uh, records coming in? Yes, Your Honor. And why are they all being read to me now? Because I think the record needs to be uh, clear. Well, if they're exhibit, they will be a part of the record. Duly noted, Your Honor. You have to just point out one more? Yes. Did at some point she ask you about whether or not the detectives were looking through his things? I believe so. And did she continue to ask you about the letter uh, during the months of August, September, October? Yes. You mean the suicide letter? Yes. Did you actually go uh, to this Homer's for Conrad event? Yes. And where was that held? In Plainville, Mass. Did you ever have any conversations with Michelle Carter about that, why it was being held in Plainville? No. And when, uh, who went with you to the event? Uh, the girls went with their dad and I went with my boyfriend. And what was the actual date, do you recall? September 13, 2014. And why was that date significant? because it was a day after his birthday. And would this be the um, third time that you had seen Michelle Carter in your yes. life? And uh, how did you, well, let me ask you this, describe the event, what, what did, what, did it, um, what was going on? Um, at the baseball tournament? Yes. It was just, she just wanted to uh, do a fundraiser in honor of him. And when you uh, went there, was there uh, a lot of people there? Yes. And how many people would you say were in attendance? I don't know, maybe six or seven teams. And so six or seven teams, multiple people on each team? Mm -hmm. How many people in total, if you had to guess? I don't know, maybe 70. Okay. And were some of them uh, her friends? They were mostly all her friends and family. Okay. And so how did you feel well, when you were there? I wasn't ready. I mean, I'm, uh, I don't know. I mean, but I thought it was nice what she was doing. And again, had she had any conversation with you up in the, this point, and this is now September 13 of 2014, about being on the phone with your son on the night that he died? No. Do you recall when your last conversation or text message or, or contact was with the defendant? It was, uh, I believe it was around December 2014. And I'm going to direct your attention to one last text message. This would be um, on September 22nd, 2014, text number three. Do you recall receiving this from Michelle Carter? I can't even imagine, but they are such beautiful and amazing girls, Lynn. They have always had a bright future. This bump in the road is a tragic one and life-changing for many, but I believe in them and I know they will be all right. Do you recall receiving that? Yes. Who was she talking about? The bump in the road. No, who were the girls that she was talking about? My girls. Did you ever give that letter to Michelle? No. Did you ever communicate with Michelle Carter's parents at all? Uh, yes. And how was that? Uh, her mother messaged me on Facebook. And when was that that you would have gotten the message, if you recall? Um, maybe a few months after Co passed. Was it after the fundraising event? It was before. 
Hold on, please, Ron. I would have no further questions. Your Honor, I'd ask that the disk with those text messages were isolated, just Ms. Roy be marked for ID. Is there an objection? No. Yeah. Maybe marked as uh, three, I think? Yes, Judge. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you say you, are, you have concluded, Ms. Lynn? Yes, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Dahl, I, I do beg, uh, please use about two minutes, though, Your Honor. All right, we'll, we'll take a five minute recess. Thank you. All rise. Okay. Uh, Mr. Stella, you set the proceed, sir. Yes. Thank you very much. mentioned on your direct testimony, uh, Conrad obtained a captain's license, did he? Yes. And, um, and did you say he was uh, happy to have received that captain's license? Yes. And uh, didn't he do that just to please his dad and his dad's family? No. Did you ever tell any uh, police officers or anyone, did you ever tell any police officers he only obtained his captain's license to please his dad? That's not the only reason. But did you ever tell anybody that? It was a, a big reason. Okay. He wanted to make his family proud. Okay. And uh, he wasn't upset about obtaining his uh, captain license? No, he wanted to. That and um, about his working? Is it feedback here? <laughs> Judge, I apologize. Uh, when we were off uh, the bench, we were trying to get the volume up a little bit for the people in the back of the gallery. Can't All right. Sell right. Yeah, an awful lot of feedback now. Sure. Can you put it back to where it was? I hope that we can. Okay. Let's call in our gentleman here again. If you're sitting in the back and you're not hearing well, there appears to be some seats. You should feel free, even if you're a member of the press to move a little bit forward. The restrictions as to the press are now different because of the fact we don't have a jury. Well, so if you need to move a little closer, please feel free to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This we do have the two front rows. Nobody in the two front rows except the families of the two, the two families involved. Okay, hopefully that will assist some of you in hearing the, the testimony and the questions. All right, should we try again? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Ms. Wright, there was a, uh, a, a notebook of, of Conrad's found. Is that correct, after his death? There was a few. There were a few? Mm-hmm. Okay, and uh, who found the, there was a particular note with, uh, a, a note that he had left for Michelle Cobb. Do you remember obtaining that one? Yes. Did you actually find that note? I did. Okay, where did you find that note? It was in one of the notebooks. In, in which home? I don't recall. Okay, so you might have gone over to his dad's house and found it there. Uh, or it, perhaps he gave it to me, yes. Perhaps who gave it to you? His father. Okay, you just have no memory of who actually found it? No. Okay. Is that meaning that's correct, you just have no memory? I have no memory. And did you notice whether or not there were, um, of the notebooks, any pages ripped out? I don't recall. And uh, in 2013, in the summer of 2013, uh, how was Conrad doing? He was working, playing baseball. Did he... Uh, did he go into see a Dr. Brule? Uh, that was his pediatrician. Okay. And, and did you accompany uh, him to Dr. Brule's office? Uh, probably. I mean, isn't it uh, true that Dr. Brule wanted to him, uh, Conrad, his son, to go to an inpatient program at that time? I don't recall. Okay. Do you recall anybody in the summer of 2013 wanting uh, Conrad to go into an inpatient program? 
Uh, he was at a rowing camp, and I don't recall rowing? after. He was at a rowing camp okay. um, in August 2013. I don't recall. Did he come home from the rowing camp yes. at some point? And he left early? Yes. And uh, he then went to see his doctor? He was with his father. I, I, don't, I don't remember the event afterwards. Were you present uh, with Conrad in the summer of 2013 when he uh, refused to go into an inpatient program? I don't remember him refusing to. Now, you um, are a nurse by training, is that correct? Yes. And uh, during the uh, period of time where uh, Conrad, in September, of 2011. Is that when uh, he first went into a, a facility? Yes. Okay. And uh, they gave him medication as a result of that? Is that when he started his course of treatment? Uh, I don't think he took medication at that okay. at that time. But September that was for some suicidal ideation? Uh, no, he was having um, lack of sleep, insomnia, anxiety. And that was after you and your husband slept? I was in the process, yes. And was he a good friend with uh, Tom Gamble back then as, as well? Yes. And has he always remained a uh, close friend, Tom Gamble, that is? Yes. And did you used to see uh, your son and Tom Gamble, uh, Tom Gamble hang out frequently? Yes. And would it be fair to say they were best friends? Yes. And your son at some point went up and lived in Fitchburg with uh, Tom. Yes. And when was that? Uh, 2014. And uh, uh, the beginning of June. June, the beginning of June of 2014. Yes. And how long did he live with Tom? Um, less than a week. Okay. And he was planning to go to uh, Fitchburg State? Yes. And Tom was uh, what, a year ahead of him in school already at Fitchburg? Yes. And then your uh, son came home. Yes. And your son told you that he ended up, he'd not, he didn't want to go to Fitchburg State. He didn't say he didn't want to go. But what did he say? He just said he didn't want to be there at that time. Okay. The future, he didn't want to go. He never said that. When you were walking on the beach with him on July 12th? He said, I'm not sure what I want to do right now, Mom. Right now? Yeah. And did he tell you when you were walking the beach that he wasn't sure if he wanted to go to Fitchburg State? He said he was not sure what I want to do right now, Mom. Okay. And that's when you had mentioned he could go to work with his father? Sure. In that um, time that you were on the beach, uh, who was present other than you and your son? My daughters and their friend, Natalie. And um, he, did he leave the beach to go get the bathing suit, or did he get a bathing suit? No, he left the beach to use the phone. Okay, so he, did he arrive at the beach with a bathing suit? He uh, ended up forgetting it. Okay, so he, so he said he, he went to Dad's house to get his bathing suit, but apparently he did not bring it home. Okay, so when the two of you, the plan was to go to the beach, <coughs> and he said... To, where was he when he said, I need to go get my bathing suit? He was at my house. Okay. And In so the you morning. Went to, you went to the beach in two separate automobiles? No. He went to, he left my house, went to Dad's house to get his bathing suit in no, the morning. I'm sorry, you and your son, did you go, uh, did you go to the beach in two separate automobiles? No. We okay. were together. In whose automobile? My boyfriend's car. Okay. But he left separately to go get his bathing suit. Yeah, that was Saturday morning. Okay. And he ended up telling you he'd never obtained his bathing suit. Is that right? Yeah, when we got to the beach, he said he forgot it. Okay. I think in your direct uh, testimony, you had mentioned that your son was spiritual? Yes. Okay. And could you describe what you meant by spiritual? Uh, he believed greatly in God. And um, did he own any rosary beads? Yes. And how many? Um, I'm not sure how many, but I know that I gave him one a few months before he passed. That was mine for my first communion. And he had dad's when dad went to the Vatican to meet the Pope. 
And is it fair to say that those items were recovered from his truck after his passing? Yes. And at, um, at some point in your direct examination, I think there you had mentioned that he was compliant in taking his medication. Yes, he took it himself. And when you said he was compliant in taking his medication, um, it's fair to say he was on and off various medications for a period of a few yes. years. Were there some times that, in fact, he um, did go off his medication and wasn't compliant? He did because he said he was feeling better and he didn't need the medication. It was kind of making him feel off, which medication does have side effects, it makes you very drowsy. And so he, in fact, uh, didn't, he, in fact, also, um, in your words, self-medicated with marijuana. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And did that, um, let me ask you about his living arrangements. After, uh, you and your uh, former husband uh, separated. There were various points in times that you shared custody? He was old enough. He chose to go where he wanted to go, so. Okay, so would he just appear here one night and have the next? Or sure, wherever, he, yeah. His dad is a tugboat captain, was away a lot, so mostly the, the kids were with me most of the time because of that fact. Okay, when you say the kids, you meant all three of your children? All three of my children. And was there any point in time that you ever tried to kick them out of your house? Uh, kick them out? No, yeah. I told them to leave one day. I didn't kick them out. Okay, um, and when did you tell them to leave one day? He was smoking marijuana in the house. So. And was that fair to say that might have been in March of 2014? Probably. <clears throat> okay, and other than your house, and his father's house. Uh, was he living with anybody else no. during this? Okay. And it would be uh, fair to say that in February of 2014, um, he stopped staying over with his father. Sure. Right, and that's because uh, his father was charged with uh, an assault and battery on him. They got in a fight. Sustain your answer to the question. Time. Sure. Thank you. And in with you. Yes. Okay. And then approximately that's when you had you told him because of the marijuana he was going to have to move out. I didn't say he had to move out. What did you say to him? Um, well, you can't accept that that behavior in the house, as a parent. You know, I just said you have to. You can't do that in the house. He was just upset because I said that, and he just. He came back that night. And when uh, the two of you were walking on the beach, um, how was his, what was his attitude like? Uh, we were smiling at some people on the beach and there was kite flying. We were looking at those and we just had a mother and son talk I talked to him very often. We were close. You, okay. And um, he never complained to you about a girl by the name of Michelle Cobb, did he? No. Okay. He never told you that anybody was uh, threatening to hurt him? No. He never told you that anybody was trying to convince him to do something he didn't want to do? No. Did he appear to be despondent on the beach? His affect was up and down. But when you were speaking to him, it seemed like he had all his faculties? Yes. Okay. He understood what you were saying? Absolutely. And the two of you at that point in time of your relationship were very close? Yes. And did you talk uh, to him about uh, a cognitive behavioral therapist? I talked to him. He, want, he wanted to seek uh, a, a therapist in cognitive behavioral. And so we found a, um, under an insurance, some, someone in Florida. And, and did he tell you, <clears throat> well, I don't think it will do any good? 
in, re in reference to the cognitive, uh, cognitive behavioral therapist? Uh, he wanted to see this, this person, um, but I believe the counselor that he saw, um, I don't know, kind of persuade him in that way. In that way. So, but my question is, did he, you and your son on the beach spoke about his potentially seeing a cognitive behavioral therapist, right? No, he had seen he had seen a counselor beforehand. Okay, and did he tell you he didn't think that was going to do any good? Uh, no, I don't recall. He, him do you saying recall that. ever saying that to anybody else that your son told you? Well, I don't think it will do any good. I believe he may have said that to his father. Okay. In an interview with Detective Gordon, did you tell Detective Gordon that you your son? said, I don't think it will do any good? I don't recall. And on the uh, beach, after he talked to you about uh, maybe not going on to Fitchburg, he, you talked to him about he could go work for his father. Is that right? Sure. Okay. And um, how, was his, uh, how was his relationship at that point in time with his father? It was fine. Fine. Mm -hmm. And uh, when did he start sleeping back over at his father's after mid-February of 2014? Yes. And when did he start staying over there again? Um, I can't recall the dates, but it was a short span time that they were kind of not talking. Did to he, um, did Conrad, your son, ever tell you um, that his father was a stress in his life? He never t told me that. Was his father a stress? Causing him stress. Uh, there's many things that caused him stress. Okay. And was one of them his dad? At times, I suppose. And at that point in time, how was your relationship with your ex-husband? Yeah. Same. And after you left the beach, the, uh, your group all left in the same automobile? A group, yes. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you went home? Oh, uh, yes, we went home. And when you got home, was his uh, pickup truck at the house, your son's? Uh, I believe it was, yes. Okay. And um, how long did you stay home for? Uh, he left right away with the girl to get ice cream and food. And how, which automobile did he take to take his sisters? He took my Volvo wagon. Okay. And he left his pickup truck was still at the house? Yes. And uh, did you have an opportunity to walk by his pickup at that point in time? No. Okay. You didn't know what was inside it or not? No. And would, uh, by the way, would Conrad at times uh, take his uh, pick up and go off and maybe uh, sleep in his vehicle? I don't recall him sleeping in his, in his vehicle. You never told the police officer there would be times he would just leave? And a, friend, a friend told the police officers that. You didn't? Why, how? A, a mother would let their child sleep in a truck. He would just go off for rides and go take a nap in his Well, vehicle. when he was not with me, I don't know what he was doing. And uh, did you ask him if he, when he returned from ice cream with his sisters, what time was that? I want to say around 5.30. And um, how long was he at the house before he left? Uh, an hour, about an hour. Okay. Close to an hour, maybe. And during that hour, uh, were you chatting with him? Uh, sure. Yeah, he was in the living room, okay. in the kitchen. Well, uh, is close to the living room. And to the best of your uh, recollection, what was his attitude like? Uh, it was, he was laughing with my boyfriend. My oh. boyfriend made a joke, which they often joked around together, and he was laughing about it. Uh, he didn't appear to, to you to be upset? No, he seemed preoccupied. Okay. And um, nothing that caused you alarm? No. And then he left the house at about 6.30? Approximately. 
And uh, did you ask him if he was going to be home for dinner? Yes. Right, and he told you he wouldn't be? He said, I don't think so. And when he left the house, um, did he have, was he carrying anything when he left? No. Now, just, uh, I had asked you, but let me make sure I'm clear on this. During um, the four months from February until uh, four and a half months, I guess, until uh, mid-July of 2014, um, his relationship with his father, would it be fair to say it wasn't close? Uh, from February to July? Yes. Uh, it wasn't close during those two couple, a couple of weeks that okay. they were. Did you fighting. ever tell uh, Detective Gordon that during those four months, four plus mm -hmm. months, his relationship with his dad was not a good one? It wasn't the greatest one, no. But it got better. In uh, Conrad's schooling, um, to go back for a minute, is he went to several different uh, high schools, or, a couple, or was it two or three? Two. Okay. And um, during that period of time, he also took a year off? Yes. And when did he actually get suspended from school? Objection. Sustained. And in uh, June of 2016, did you, I'm sorry, in June of 2014, did you accompany your son to his uh, therapist sessions? No. Why not? Because he was 18. Did you accompany to him to his therapist sessions when he was 17? Yes. His father also did. And you met Michelle Carter prior to your son's uh, passing on one occasion? Yes. And, and did you ever speak to her on the phone uh, prior to July of 2014? No. One moment, please, Mark. And Ariana Taylor, do you know her? Yes. And that's, that, that was another uh, friend of Conrad's? Yes. Did, uh, did you see Conrad and Ariana hanging out on a frequent basis? Yes. Okay, would it be fair to say they were close friends? Yes. Did you, use, did you know whether or not Conrad was uh, communicating with Ariana in uh, 2014? Yes. Okay. And uh, they were communicating with one another? Yes. Did you see him at times uh, together physically? Yes. And um, how long has he been friends with her? Uh, they met and uh, well, they rode together, so maybe 2012. Okay. And um, your son also had uh, another close friend, Louis, was it? Yes. And in uh, 2014, did, you use, did your son, if you know, have communications with Louie? Yes. And uh, were they close friends? Yes. And did they also used to pal around together? Yes. The um, notebook, are you aware uh, whether or not um, there were any other notes left in the notebook that you came into uh, the notebook that Michelle Carter's letter was Yes. In? Were there other notes? Yes. And those notes were to? Myself. Okay. And anyone else? Dad. And sisters. Were those notes uh, dated? Um, yes. And, and is it fair to say that those notes were dated in 2012? Um, maybe. I'm not sure of the dates. Oh, uh, you don't? And those uh, notes were saying goodbye to you? Um, not necessarily. I can't recall. They were expressing his emotions towards us. Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you very much. Any redirect, Counsel? Nothing further. Let me step down, Mr. Roy. Thank you very much for your assistance. Uh,
have another one. I do, Your Honor. Thank you very much. Officer David Correa, please. All right, please. Officer Correa. <clears throat> Roy, of course, is welcome to remain in the courtroom if she wishes. Absolutely, Your Honor. I'll express that to her. Thank you very All much. Right. I do. Thank you. All right, please take a seat, officer, and make yourself nice and comfortable. Keep your voice up nice and loud, and when you sound uncomfortable, you state your full name and spell your last name for the record. David Michael Correa, last name C O R R E I A. And you are a police officer, sir? I am currently on a part time status. I retired in 2015. Town of Fairhaven. For how long had you served as a police officer with Fairhaven? Town of Fairhaven since 1996. Did you serve in any other roles other than as patrolman? No. All right. And prior to coming to work for Fairhaven, did you work with any other police agency? Yes. What was that for? Uh, I started in Falmouth in uh, June 4th of 1980, Mashpee in 1985 and New Bedford in 1987. All right. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. So you indicated that you are, uh, were a, a long-time uh, police officer in the town of Fairhaven, is that correct? Yes. Could you tell us a little bit about the town of Fairhaven? Um, what other cities does it uh, abut? Just a little background on how big Fairhaven is, that kind of thing. Fairhaven has a full-time population of approximately 18,000 people. It abuts the towns of Acushnet, Mattapoisett, and New Bedford with a river and a harbor between us and New Bedford. And is there actually a, um, uh, so there's a bridge that sometimes comes up and you sort of get stuck on one side or the other for a period of time? It doesn't go up, it swings, it's a swing bridge. Now you indicated that there is a, a full-time residency. Does the uh, residency of Fairhaven uh, tend to go up a little bit in the summertime? Yes. And uh, are you aware of any sort of uh, large shopping complexes or areas where there's uh, bigger stores or sort of small strip mall areas? Yes, there's several of them. Now I'm going to call your attention to a particular day. That would be July 13th of 2014. Were you working that day? Yes, I was. Do you remember what shift you were working? I was working overtime the day shift, 8 to 4. And in the summer months in Fairhaven on the day shift, approximately how many officers would be on, on Fair, at the police department? It's the same all the time. It would be for, for the patrol division. It would be three officers and one supervisor. And the three officers, would that, those people, unless they're writing reports or doing other things, would they be on the road? Yes. And on that particular day, on July 13, 2014, were you working uh, on patrol, meaning you were going to be out on the road? Yes. And at some point, sir, did you get some information um, about um, something that needed your attention? Yes. How did you get that information, sir? I was dispatched to uh, uh, 13 Hamlet Street to speak to a woman about a missing person. And it dispatches what, sir? That is the dispatcher takes the call, routes the call to the unit that uh, serves that particular area. And you got sent to 3 Hamlet Street in the city and strike that in the town of Fairhaven, is that correct? I believe it was 13. 13, excuse me. And when you got there, was that a single family home or a multi-family dwelling? Single family home. And it appeared that anybody was home? Yes. Did you go inside the home or did you talk to somebody outside the home? I talked to somebody inside the home. And was that person a male or a female? There was both male and female. Did the woman identify herself or did you learn who she was? Yes. And who was that, please? It was Mrs. Roy. And who was she with, if you know? She was with her current boyfriend. I don't remember his name. What was her demeanor? How did she seem? She was upset. And what about 
her uh, physical appearance or tone of voice led you to believe that she was upset? She appeared to have been crying. Her eyes were a little bit puffy. She was a little bit uh, shaky in her um, stance. What time was this approximately? Two o'clock in the afternoon. So you get there, you get a dispatch, you go to Hamlet Street, you encounter a woman who appears to be upset. Is that right? That's correct. Do you get some information from her? Yes. And uh, with regard to the two people, so a, uh, um, Mrs. Roy, Ms. Roy, and her boyfriend, who was doing the majority of the talking during this conversation? Mrs. Roy. And just yes or no, do you learn some information? I'm sorry. Do you learn some information? From her, yes. And about getting that information, um, when she describes sort of why she needs help, um, what do you do with the information she gives you? I start an investigation. And what does that entail, please? That particular investigation entailed looking for her son, Conrad Roy III. And in speaking to his mother, did you get some identifying information as to what car he might drive, what his description is, sort of what he looks like, that sort of information? Yes. What do you then do with that information, officer? I put it out in a broadcast to the three towns that, that uh, we serve on our radio frequency. I also uh, call over to New Bedford and ask them to put out a broadcast because they're on a separate frequency. I enter a missing persons report into NCIC, and I have a bolo put out uh, through what's called a GBC, a general broadcast to the area. And just for clarification, a bolo is a be on the lookout, is that correct? Yes. What were the three adjoining towns that are sort of all part of the same um, you know, do you remember who you put this information out to? Fairhaven, Acushnet, and Mattapoisett all share the same radio frequency. And New Bedford, I called over and spoke to one of the uh, call takers over there and had their dispatcher put out a bolo. And when a missing persons report uh, is generated, how does that go out or what did you do to make sure people could see it? The bolo initially. That's the initial start. And then through NCIC, which is the national, uh, national database. I don't remember what the initials stand for. But that would go out so that if anybody stopped that vehicle or that person and ran their, their plate or their person, their personal information, it would flag that they were wanted somewhere for something. Okay. Thank you. And at that point, uh, did you also, in speaking with um, Conrad's mother, did you try to get the names of any of his friends who might know where he is. Yes. And do you remember the names of friends that you got or who you tried to contact? Yes, I believe one was Ariel Taylor and the other one was Joseph, I can't remember Joseph's last name. And do you remember looking, uh, speaking to a Tom Gamble? I'm sorry, Tom Gamble, yes. And just yes or no, without going to the details of what uh, they may have told you, did you speak with Ariana Taylor? Yes, I did. Okay. And did that provide you with any information as to where Conrad might be? No. Did you speak to Tom Gamble? Yes. And did that provide you with any information as to where Conrad might be? No. Did you also get the name of a Louie or Lou Pina? Yes. And were you able to reach him at that time? No. Now, were you, did you become aware from speaking to Conrad's mother uh, that he had a cell phone? Yes. And were you aware as a police officer whether or not you can try to track a phone or figure out where it was when it was last used? Yes. Okay. And uh, did you do anything to see if you could figure out where Conrad's phone might be to help you figure out where he might be? Yes. What did you, can you tell the court what you did? I contacted uh, AT&T, his cell phone provider, and I had them ping the cell phone. And what does pinging mean based on your understanding of what ping means? Uh, that they try and find out where the last position of the cell phone was. The technical term for it, I have no idea. Okay. And so you did that, is that correct? Yes. And did that provide you with any information? Yes. They gave me a location just north of 13 Hamlet Street, approximately in the area of Coster's Farm, which I assumed was the uh, cell phone tower that was on Coster's Farm property. So there is actually a cell phone tower right there? Yes, there is. Okay. Now having this information where you've called some of his friends, they don't know where he is, his mom doesn't know where he is, trying to figure out where his phone is. Do you then do something yourself to try to find him? Yes, I begin searching for him myself. Tell the judge what you did, if you could, please. I start off at Fish Island in New Bedford. It's just over the river in, uh, into New Bedford. That's where the family has a, uh, a small docking area for their tugboats. Didn't find the vehicle in Fish Island. I started making my way back into Fairhaven when I ran across another vehicle that looked just like the one that I was looking for. Was that the... The vehicle that looked like it, did that end up being the vehicle or just sort of looked like it? No. Okay. It, fit the, it matched the description. So did you follow that car? Yes, I did. 
And where did you follow it to? I followed the car down Middle Road, sorry, Middle Street, and then uh, east on Washington Street, trying to get close enough to get the plate number off to, to, to determine if it was or was not the vehicle I was looking for. And where was that sort of bringing you? Are there any landmarks that you can give us around where you were sort of following this car to see if it was the car? Uh, well, down Middle Street, uh, there's a few landmarks down there, the Peace Park boat ramp, uh, a bar down there. Then up Washington Street, the landmarks would be the police station, the fire station. It would eventually the, turn into the Kmart parking lot, which is at the end of Washington Street, and I followed it in, in, in there. Okay. Now, sir, um, how long were you a police officer with Fairhaven? Almost 20 years. And you work patrol that whole time? Yes. Are you familiar with the layout of Fairhaven, the streets um, that are in Fairhaven, uh, where the Kmart parking lot, where the police station is? Are you familiar with the layout of Fairhaven? Yes. Uh, and this morning, did I ask you to look at some uh, overview uh, maps of uh, particular locations of Fairhaven to see if you could identify them? Yes. And did they look familiar to you? Yes. If I, if I may, Your Honor, uh, and I believe we don't have an objection, um, display those to the, uh, to the officer. Okay. Uh, Council, can you see? I, I'm going to wait. Yep. Uh, can I ask you, with the court's permission, may the officer stand up? Yes, of Thank course. You. All right, officer. Um, if you could just sort of back there and so we're not mm -hmm. blocking the judge's view. Could you tell the court what we're looking at here, please? Okay. This is Washington Street, where I followed the vehicle down. That's the, um, that's the funeral home right over there. The fire station and the police station will be farther down there. This is Washington this, Street? Yep. And this is Kmart right here. So this structure here, this is Kmart here. Kmart's on that side. This side is Staples, the dollar store, a small restaurant. And this parking lot here, would that be the parking lot that was for Kmart and the dollar store and the other store there? Yes, it is. What main road is right along there? Huddleston Avenue, also known as Route 6. And across the way, are there other, uh, a 7-Eleven, a Dunkin' Donuts, and other um, type places here, stores and that, that sort of thing? Yes. Um, and we're both away from the microphone, so we'll just both keep our voices as loud as we can. Okay. Yes, sir. So, so uh, uh, counsel and your honor can hear Okay. So, this area here, if I may, put Kmart on there. Counsel, any objection to me just writing Kmart? No. Thank you. Okay. That's Kmart there, correct? Correct. All right. So, you're on Washington Street. Can you now walk the court now using this map to where you followed the car you thought might be the car? Sure. The vehicle I was following, a black F-250, went into the parking lot of Kmart and then started going behind Kmart. That's a common cut through for the people that, uh, that live in the area that want to get down to Sconaconic Road. I followed the vehicle down and I saw the vehicle turn around behind Kmart. That was where I lost sight of that particular vehicle. Now, when you lost sight of the vehicle you were behind, um, now you're, and it's sort of, and you can see, would this be sort of the, you go around, K, do you go around Kmart there? Yep, I was right at the corner where the garden shop is. Now this area here that is sort of along that cut through, and there are parking spaces there. Yes, there are. Right. If I now, Your Honor, if I, if I could ask that they be marked as the next exhibit, please. Is there an objection? Yeah. May be marked. Thank you. Now, sir, showing you a, would this be a closer up version of, again, now this being, if I may, Kmart, would this be the back area that we're talking about? This would be the back area right here of Kmart. This would be the west side of Kmart. And would this be the area where there's parking spaces sort of adjacent to Kmart? Yes. So you're following that black car you think might be the car along here. Once you uh, get to start to get towards the side of Kmart, um, what do you see? I, out of the corner of my eye, on the right-hand side, I see another black 
F-250, like the vehicle I was looking for. And it, did you see that vehicle here, sort of a few spaces in on the side of Kmart? Yes, right about where your finger is, right there. If I could put it your, uh, next where okay. my finger is. Thank you. Did that vehicle call your attention? Yes, it did. Okay. Why did that vehicle call your attention? Because the plate number on that vehicle matched the plate number of the vehicle I was looking for. It was the car stationary at the time? Yes, it was. If you could please resume your seat. Thank you, ma'am. If I may ask to be Mars the next exhibit, please, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Maybe Mark. Thank you, Your Honor. Should be number five, Your Honor. Thank you. So now that you see that the car that's parked and sort of adjacent to Kmart, the license plate matches, sir, what do you do next? I call it in that I'm off with that vehicle. I exit my vehicle and I walk over to the vehicle to see if there's anybody inside. Now at this point, sir, are you by yourself? Yes, I am. And what are you driving? A uh, marked police car, Unit 409, I believe, that day. And do you recall where you placed your car in relationship to this pickup truck? Towards the left rear quarter, parked perpendicular to that particular vehicle. That vehicle was facing west, all right, my vehicle was facing south. At this point, sir, are there any other cars parked adjacent to the pickup truck? No. Now, at this point, is there anybody, I know you said you were by yourself, but is there anybody else over there? Is Not there? at that time that I saw, no. What do you do? I walk over to the vehicle and I look inside. Now, can you please tell the court how you approach the vehicle? I approach the vehicle cautiously cautiously from the back, from the driver's side. Your Honor, I believe uh, we're going to have a series of photographs that, uh, that will be by agreement, Your Honor. All right. Are you going to admit them as one collective exhibit? I would like that, please, Your uh, Honor. Any objection? May be done. I'm just going to, if I could just count them for the record, Your Honor, put that number on the record. So, one, two, three. For the record, Your Honor, Exhibit 6 has 14 uh, pictures included in it. Okay. Now, sir, I'm going to um, publish these, and there's going to be a um, video screen, a, a screen, so I'll just ask you to look at that. Um, and. I'm showing the first one of this group, Your Honor, of Exhibit 6. Do you recognize what's depicted in that first photograph from Exhibit 6, sir? Yes, I do. And what is that, please? That is the vehicle I was looking for. And are we looking at the driver's side? Yes, we are. Now, what are these here? Those are racks used by the uh, garden department of Kmart. Now, can I actually borrow the um, exhibit five back again? Now, sir, showing you exhibit five. Can you I, stand right in front of the jury box? Right there? Yeah, okay. So exhibit five here. Uh, so this is the parking lot of Kmart, or the, the joint parking lot? Yes, ma'am. Now, this area here, that's sort of in front of Kmart, that appears to be an open area, what is that? That's the garden shop, and there is an open area in front of the garden shop where they put uh, soil, uh, peat moss, mulch, plants, things like that. So in July of 2014, which is a, a warmer month, would there have been, would this area have been filled with those types of items that Kmart would sell, gardening items? Objection. Pause. A little, little bit of <laughs> Uh, I'll allow it. Okay. Do, you, answer, sir. do you recall if there's gardening type items kept in there in July of 2014? Specifically, no, but that would be where they would keep them. Thank you. Now, so back to Exhibit 6. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. So these are sort of racks. That's what they, when you got there that day, did those appear to be racks? Yes. Now, how did you approach the car? Can you walk us through it? Um, if you look at the uh, left rear taillight there, I would walk up to the car from right about where your finger is, yes, forward, 
right, cautiously, like I was taught through my training and experience, and look inside the car, look inside the uh, driver's side. Now from, and now I'm going to show you the second picture. I'm just going to pull out a little bit. From, and for the record, you're on exhibit six, uh, second picture, from your position as you make your way up, further up to the driver's side, could you see anything or anyone inside from your position? Yes. Okay, what could you see? I could see a human form inside, a young white male. At what point in going, sort of making your way up, did you notice that there was a, a person inside? Uh, right about where you see the, uh, the small window at the back. Right there? Yes, right where the Mass Maritime sticker is. And what did you see when in this position here with this Mass Maritime sticker is? Were you looking in the car at that point? Yes, I was. So you're peering in. How, how far away from the vehicle are you when you're looking in? Not more than three feet. And what do you see? I see a, a, a person, just the back of the head of a person, the side of their face, uh, leaning back against the headrest. Now, showing you uh, Exhibit 6, Picture 4, is this a closer up? Uh, picture of, of uh, this particular area, the smaller window here in the uh, driver's window. Yes. Fair to say, when you saw it though, this was completely closed. Yes. Now as you make your way now closer up to the driver's side, you see that there's someone inside, what do you do next? I go a little bit further to, uh, to get a better look at them, up to the uh, driver's side window. I look inside and, and I see that it appears to be Mr. Conrad Roy. And how did you, what led you to believe it was Mr. Conrad Roy at that particular time? From seeing a picture of him earlier. Who had shown you a picture? His mother. What parts of Mr. Roy's body or face were you able to see when you peered more closely into the car? Yeah, his face, his, uh, his upper body, um, right down to about his waist. Did it appear that anybody else was inside the car? No, there was nobody else in the vehicle. At this point, sir, with uh, sort of, as you're getting closer now seeing someone you believe now to be Conrad, were you still by yourself? Yes. And when you looked in, when you got to the place where you now can tell it's Conrad or you believe it's Conrad, do you open the door or do you wait? I wait. Why did you wait? There was a fear that Mr. Roy had committed suicide in such a way that it might present a danger to others. We had had an issue with that a few months before and part of our training was to wait until the vehicle was cleared by a hazmat expert. The issue before had nothing to do with Mr. Conrad, correct? No. Just something in Fairhaven? No, it was something in another community, but we were told to watch out for it because it could be uh, harmful, if not fatal to us, if we got involved. And as such, what did you do? I called the fire department. And where is the fire department in relation to the police department? They, they both, they share the same building. They abut each other. And that building where the fire department and the police department are, where is it in relation to the Kmart where you found Mr. Roy's body? perhaps a tenth of a mile away. And did someone come, I'm sorry, no, no. did someone come from the fire department and assist you in determining if there was any sort of danger to you or any other officers? Yes, Could Lieutenant you, Walter Therian. Okay, you know, who, does he, who is he to you? He's a uh, lieutenant in charge of uh, the shift at that particular time of the fire department. And uh, at some point after you made this call, did Lieutenant Therian arrive? Yes, he showed up with an engine. Did you watch him? Yes. And when you mean engine, do you mean fire engine? Fire engine, yes. What did you see him do? He looked inside the vehicle and he made the determination that it was safe to enter. What did you do then? We entered the vehicle. What did you see inside? Uh, we saw a body in the, uh, the driver's seat. Showing you exhibit six, number five. Is that what you saw? I would have seen it from the opposite side. You're looking from the passenger side on that. And were you able to look, when you saw him from the passenger side, could you see his face? Yes. Showing you the next picture in the series of exhibits. Was that the face that you saw from the driver's side? Yes, and I could see that face from the window even before I entered the vehicle. And did it appear that he had, I'm not asking you just to look at the picture, but when you saw Conrad's um, body, did he have something on his face? You mean besides the sunglasses? Did he have sunglasses on? He had sunglasses and a hat on. 
Now, when you looked at the area of his nose, was there any something about his nose that called your attention? It was a general redness about the body that I, that I saw. I'm showing you the next. About the skin of the body. Was there a redness to, is that the redness to his nose you're talking about? Yes. Now, after you made object strike that, uh, when after you saw now the door is open and you see uh, Conrad's body, uh, did you examine him at all? Yes. And um, were you looking for signs of life? Yes. What type of signs of life were you looking for? Pulse, breathing. Did you see any of those? No. He was pulseless. He wasn't, wasn't breathing. His skin was warm to the touch but uh, it appeared that rigor had already started to set in. Okay. And uh, did you check his hands? Yes. Um, now, you said he was warm to the touch. What was the, based on your having been in the car, um, what would you estimate the temperature of the car inside was? At that time in the 80s. H had it been a warm night the night before, if you recall? It had been a warm night and a warm day. That particular day was in the high 70s, low 80s. So seeing and noticing no f signs of life on Conrad um, or about his body, what did you do next? Uh, we waited for the ambulance to arrive to make a confirmation that he was beyond medical help. And did an ambulance or did a EMT or pan paramedic arrive? Two paramedics, firefighter Joy Nichols, who is now Lieutenant Joy Nichols, and firefighter David uh, Gordon. And did you watch what they did? Yes, they did. And what did you see them, without going into any detail of what they said to you, just what did you see them do? Uh, paramedic Gordon went up to um, Mr. Roy and made the determination that he was beyond medical help. When you have a situation, sir, in your training experience, when you have the body of an individual who is beyond medical help, what is the procedure? It's considered an unattended death at that time. We have a call-out list of certain people that we call and notify, and then we start an investigation. And would an unattended death be a death that occurs outside of a medical setting? Yes. Now, when there is an unattended death, and this is based on your training and experience, there is an unattended death. Is, are there other agencies uh, that need to be notified? Yes. Okay. And can you tell us a little bit about who those agencies are? CPAC, which is the uh, investigative branch of the uh, district attorney's office, uh, members of our own detective division, our chief of police, and the medical examiner's office. And to your knowledge, were those various agencies contacted? Yes. Now, we've been looking at photographs here, sir. Do you recall anyone on scene taking photographs as sort of the scene was unfolding? Yes. And who would have been taking photographs? Both me and Sergeant Sabral. And do you recall any other agencies being there to take photographs? Yes, a trooper from... Uh, uh, CPAC uh, arrived to uh, take photographs. Now, at some point, sir, while Mr. Roy's body was still in the car prior to it being removed, did you have a chance to look about his person? Yes. And was there anything on his person or about his person, other than the sunglasses you talked about, that drew your attention, officer? There was a cell phone in the waistband of his uh, shorts. And could you please describe to the court the best of you can how it was situated in his shorts area? Uh, it was just pushed into the waistband of his shorts, half sticking out of his shorts. And did you do something with that phone, officer? Yes. Could you please tell the court what you did? I took the phone. If I may approach, Your Honor. Ready. Sir, I'm going to show you an item, and I'll ask if you recognize it. Yes, I do. And please tell the court what you recognize that to be. This is the phone that we found on Mr. Roy. And did you seize it? Yes. Your Honor, I would ask that it be marked, please, for, as the next exhibit. Is there any objection? Maybe mark, and we have seven, I think, right? Yes, Judge. Yes, sir. Thank you. You can keep it down. Talking to loud? Yes, sir. Am I talking too loud? No, you're doing fine. Okay. <laughs> So uh, was there a time after you saw Conrad's uh, body in the cab of the vehicle that Mr. Roy's body was taken out of the vehicle? Yes. And you mentioned a number of agencies that you called. Did any of those agencies now take, for lack of a better term, custody of Mr. Roy's body? Yes, the medical examiner's office. 
And was, how was he taken out of the car? What was he put on? He was put on a gurney by members of LaBeouf's livery service. They do the, uh, the pickup of decedents for the medical examiner's office. And showing you the next, uh, in this next photograph in the series, uh, Exhibit 6 series, would this be a picture of Mr. Conrad Roy when he's now on the, the gurney or, or sort of flat? Yes. Now, in addition to taking a look, and after Mr. Uh, Conrad Roy is out of the vehicle, or actually while he's still in it, do you yourself, officer, take a look around the car to see if you can find any elf, el anything else of note other than just the phone? Yes. Did you take a look at the ignition key or, or uh, where, how you start the car? Yes. Uh, were the keys in the ignition? No. Show you the next photograph, Your Honor. Um, is, what's that a picture of, please? That's a picture of the ignition. That's also a picture of the keys in the center console. Were well, the keys found here, sir? Those are the keys. Thank you. In addition to locating the keys, did you look around the behind the area, Mr. Uh, where Conrad had been? Yes. And did you see something that called your attention? Yes. What was that? My attention was called by Officer Darmafall to a uh, um, gasoline engine in the back seat of the uh, truck. And did you know, did you know, was it readily apparent to you what it was at that particular time? Yes. And at some point was it taken out of the vehicle? Yes. Showing you uh, the next photograph in the series of Exhibit 6, the series of Exhibit 6. Is that the item? Yes. Where was that item situated in the car, or in the truck, excuse me? It was in the back seat between, um, right in the middle of the seat, right between the, the, uh, the passenger and the driver's seat. And showing you another picture here. I'm just going to zoom out a little bit. Is that it there? Yes. While it's still in the car? Yes. Now, how was it taken out of the car, sir? Officer Darmafall took it out of the vehicle. Was it running when you were uh, when No, you it was saw? not. Did you check whether or not it was on? Yes, Officer Darmafall pointed out to me that the ignition switch was on. However, at that time, it was no longer working. No. Do you have any familiarity with these types of devices, sir? Yes. Is there a reason why a water pump would stop working even when it's on? You ran out of oxygen or fuel. So if a water pump is... If there's no more oxygen in the air, it will stop working, based yes. on your training and experience? An internal combustion engine needs oxygen for internal combustion. In addition to finding uh, the phone, the water pump, uh, did you find a license as well? Yes. Or a, a wallet? Did you see that item there, also part of Exhibit 6? Yes. And who was that a license for? Conrad Roy III. Now, while um, all of this is going on, uh, and, and you've indicated now that there's multiple people at the scene, you have firefighters, EMTs, police officers, crime scene, and at some point, the medical examiner's office. Is that correct? Yes. Now, while this is going on, sir, is anything done to what is often referred to as secure the scene? Yes. What was done to secure the scene? Crime scene tape was put up around an area to keep passers-by out of the area while the investigation took place. And, and what color is that is crime scene tape generally or yours? Yellow. It says on it, police line, do not cross. At some point, sir, after the crime scene tape was up and after sort of things are progressing as you've testified to, did you become aware of whether or not any family members of Conrad Roy had come to the scene? Yes. Please tell us how you became aware of that. I looked up and his grandfather was trying to drive under the crime scene tape in his personal vehicle. Did you do something to put a stop to that? Yes, I told him to stop. When I had a confrontation with him, he told me who he was. I told him he was going to have to leave the area. What happened with regard to the truck that Mr. Roy's dead body was found in? 
it would stayed in the area while the investigation proceeded, but as soon as we were done, the truck was given back to um, Mr. Roy. He was the owner of the truck. Mr. Roy? The grandfather. The grandfather. And was a determination made to figure out who owned the water pump? Yes. And who owned the water pump, to the best of your knowledge? That was owned by the, uh, the company, the tugboat company that Mr. Roy, the grandfather, owns. And was the water pump returned to a family member as well, if that, you know? I don't remember that one. You seized the phone you indicated, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, and uh, was it, to your knowledge, did you, did you bring it back to the station? Yes. And to your knowledge, did that phone exhibit seven, seven yeah. I believe, seven? Was exhibit seven uh, given to a detective at some later time? Eventually, yes. One moment, please, Your Honor. You may. One last question, again, pertaining to the phone. Was the phone on when you found it in, in his waistband? Was it, work, was it uh, charged up at all? No, the battery was dead. Thank you. Nothing further. Mr. Cataldo, uh, do you anticipate a lengthy cross-examination? Is that no, break not, now? Not, not lengthy. No. All right, well, we'll, we'll break now, okay. and we will resume at 2 p.m. sharp. Thank you very much. You're now off the record. Give me just one second, please. I remind you, Officer, you remain on the road? Yes, Your Honor. You may proceed when you are ready, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon, officer. Good afternoon, sir. Officer, which shift did you work on July 12th? My scheduled shift is, uh, my assigned shift is 4 to midnight, but I was working an overtime shift that day, um, 8 to 4. Okay, so on July 12th, 2014, you worked from, I'm talking about 2014, the, the year, but July 12th, not the 13th. The day before? Yes. I don't remember. Okay. And on the uh, day of, it was 8 a.m.? 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. was okay. overtime. My assigned shift was 4 p.m. to midnight. I worked a double shift. Okay, so the, the evening before, were you on duty at 11.59 p.m. on the 12th? I might have been. I don't believe so. Okay. All I'm right. not sure of that. Okay. And in any event, uh, this came my parking lot. Um, it's, it's sometimes used as a cut-through, I think you had mentioned. Yes. Can you explain that for me, please? In order to avoid the lights at Route 6 and uh, Alden Road and the lights at Route 6 and Sconaconeck Road and Route 240, sometimes locals use that. They cut through the back, go down Alden Road extension, up Drown Boulevard, and they're on Sconaconeck Road. Okay, it's so true. in the... In busier hours up on the main route in front of the Kmart, rather than hitting traffic lights, they'll cut down through the lot. It happens in all hours, sir. Oh, okay. And, and uh, so therefore, if somebody was cutting into that neighborhood, they would have driven right behind the very back of Conrad Roy's pickup truck. Objection, right? Your Honor. Oh, well. In other words, they would have driven right back behind the tail end of Conrad Roy's pickup truck. Yes. Okay. And when you were on scene, uh, did other officers arrive at some point? Police officers? Yes. And there were two other officers that arrived? Sergeant Sabral and Officer Darmafall, now Detective Darmafall. And uh, then an EMT showed up? Uh, the Th first, <clears throat> Lieutenant Therian was the first one to show up. Whether he's an EMT or not, I don't know. Okay. And so at one point there was just the four of you there? Yes. May I approach, Your Honor? You may. Thank you. So you you whatever you're approaching with, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Asking to look at Exhibit 6, the uh, first, the uh, number one of Exhibit 6. Is that a um, street light in the background? 
It might be, yes. Okay. When you say it might be, are you familiar with this lot? Yes. And does this lot have street lights? It has lighting. Um, would you call them street lights, I suppose? Oh, I guess, let me not use street light. Is that a pole, it doesn't go to the top, that a light is on the top of? Possibly. And in the, um, this lot has lamps and poles throughout the parking lot. Yes, it does. Okay. And on the uh, Exhibit 6, the picture I just showed you, it's just the picture is cut off to the very top. Yes. And that post, you'll agree, matches the other posts in the background that are attached to... The lights. one behind it that has a light on it, yes. Yes. And also in the automobile, in these photos, you, did you look inside the automobile? Yes, I did. And inside the auto, there was also a tool kit, wasn't there? I don't remember that, sir. Did you testify in front of the grand jury? No, sir. And inside the vehicle, was there a starter fluid can? I don't remember. Okay. Did you take an inventory of what was in the automobile? I would suppose I did. I'm not sure of that either, sir. I know that if we had towed the vehicle, I would have taken an inventory because it's policy, but we didn't tow the vehicle. Okay. Who took the photographs of the um, in interior of the automobile? Sergeant Sabral, myself, and the trooper from CPAC. May I approach, Your Honor? May. I ask you to take a look at that photograph. That photograph uh, taken of the interior of his automobile showing a tool kit? Yes, it is. Okay. And that was in the date you were up at the automobile on July 13th? Sir, I can only assume that it is. I don't remember seeing this tool kit. Okay. Did you take that photograph? I don't believe so, no. Okay. Your Honor, may I have that marked for identification purposes? Is there an objection? No objection to any marked for identification. It's marked as uh, exhibit, a, um, exhibit A for identification. Okay. You may return that to the clerk. May I approach you on it? May. You know, so I ask you to take a peek at that photograph. That photograph would depict some kind of starting canister? Yes. Fluid. And did you take that photograph? I'm not sure of that, sir. And do you recall whether or not you saw that in the automobile on the date in question? No, I don't recall. Okay. May I have that marked for identification purposes, John? Um, that may be done. As, no objection. As, uh, exhibit B. Did you have any conversations yourself with, um, I guess, uh, I don't know if it's you, Officer Therian, should we say? Lieutenant Therian? Lieutenant Therian. Yes. Okay. And did you drive through this lot the night prior? I don't remember if I was working the night prior. If I was, it's possible. And inside the automobile, uh, did you see if there were any phone chargers? I don't remember a phone charger. And this um, area of the lot, this is an area not usually used for um, automobiles to park? That, that would be a fair assumption, yes. Okay. And you're familiar with this lot? Yes. Okay. So th this area, even though it has parking spots, it's unusual for cars to be parked there? Yes, because it's not convenient to get into the store. Okay. And inside the, the pickup truck, there were a couple of sets of rosary beads? 
There might have been, sir. Yeah, may I approach again? You may. I can ask you to take a look at that uh, photo. Do you know if you took that photograph? It's possible that either I or Sergeant Zabral took this photograph. And I do see a set of rosary beads and what looks like a phone charger, but I'm not sure, out of the dashboard. And did you uh, look and find any receipts of any kind of purchases within the interior of the automobile? Not that I remember at this time, no. Okay. Did you go through the uh, clutter within the automobile to see what was present? Yes. Okay. And can you tell me whether or not there were any receipts that you noticed? I don't have any recollection of that. Okay. And you don't recall if there was a toolkit? No. And you don't recall if there was starter fluid? No. And do you recall if there was a, uh, a plastic canister of oil in the back seat? No. And are you the one who obtained the iPhone passcode? No. Right. Who obtained that code? I don't know. Okay. Are you the one who booted the iPhone up back at the station at any point? I plugged it in to see if it was uh, in working condition, but then I unplugged it and put it in the, uh, into my locker. My, um, filing cabinet. All right, so when you, when you say you plugged it in to see if it's in working condition, mm -hmm. so in other words, to see if it kicks on? To see if the battery was dead and that was the reason why it was off. Okay, and so you plugged it in? Yes. Okay, and how were you able to determine the battery was dead? Because uh, you look at the top right-hand corner of an iPhone and it has a battery icon that gives the percentage. Okay, and what the percentage did that show when it booted up? I don't remember, it was very low. Okay. But it did show a percentage when, at some point, the lights came on mm -hmm. and you looked and noted the percentage? Yes. Did you note that in a report anywhere? No. But there was a percentage to it? Yes. Okay. And is it safe to say you don't recall the percentage? That is safe to say. And after you saw the percentage as it was still on, did you photograph it? No. Okay, and what did you do at that point in time? I unplugged it and I put it into my uh, filing cabinet. We each have a dedicated filing cabinet to uh, each one of us that works there. Okay, so when you say you unplugged it, you didn't have the passcode at that point? No, I did not. Okay, and did you, did you turn it off or leave it on? Battery would eventually run dead again. Okay, so I guess my question is, after it booted up and it lighted up, it showed you some kind of percentage. And then once you saw that, you then took the phone and put it in a drawer somewhere? I put it into a filing cabinet, yes. Okay. You didn't power it down, in other words? No, no point to it. Okay. One moment, please. <clears throat> You need to move? Go ahead. Nothing, nothing further, Your Honor. All uh, right. Let me redirect. A couple of questions, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. Why don't we let this lady get the way, makes her way across? Oh, sorry. All right. If I may, briefly, Your Honor. Um, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, ma'am. Defense counsel asked you if you recalled if you worked the night before. That would be the day of July 12, 2014. Yes. And um, does the Fair Haven Police Department keep a list, a log of who's working when? Yes. Do you think it would refresh, uh, assist you refresh your memory to look at a log from July 12, 2014, that would be Saturday, uh, to see if you were working or not? Yes. Your Honor, may I approach with the log to see if it assists his memory? Have you seen that? Go ahead. Thank you. Could you just take a look at it and let, let us know if it refreshes your memory or not? Thank you, ma'am. Sure. Thank you. Um, 
does that, this log assist you in refreshing your memory as to whether or not you worked on July 12th? Yes, it does. And did you work that day? No, I did not. And you were asked some questions about uh, Conrad or the, the car that you found, Conrad's body, and how would you describe the general overall condition of the, the front area? Uh, clean or pretty messy? Cluttered. Nothing further, thank you. Any recross? No. All right, officer, you may step down. Thank you for your assistance in this matter. Thank uh, you. He's free to go, correct? He is free to go, thank you. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. The town will have another one. Camden Roy, please. All right. I see counsel sidebar for a moment. The witness can come up. Thank you. Good afternoon. You need to keep your voice up nice and loud so people can hear you. It would be difficult to make you repeat answers because they can't hear you the first time. Okay. So please state your full name and spell your last name for the record. Um, Camden Roy, R-O-Y. All right, thank you. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Take a deep breath. How old are you? 16. What's your date of birth? Um, 091700. You're going to keep your voice up nice and loud for us, okay? You can go oh. right into that microphone. 091700. And where do you currently live? Mattapoisett, Massachusetts. Who do you live there with? My mom and you, sister. Okay, and do you have another sibling? Yeah. Who was that? Conrad Roy. And how many years older uh, was Conrad to you? Five. And when did your brother, uh, he passed away in, on July 12, 2014? Yes. When um, you were, li were living with your mom in Mattapoiset, um, I'm sorry, in Fairhaven, do you also split time between your dad's house? Yes. And where is he living? Mattapoiset. And who do you, um, where do you go to school? Bishop Stang High School. What, what year are you in? A sophomore. Are you familiar, do you know someone by the name of Michelle Carter? Yes. And how do you know Michelle? Um, I met her in Florida. Okay. And do you remember what year it was that you met Michelle Carter? Um, 2012. Okay. Yeah. And when you were in Florida, um, what part of Florida were you in? Naples. Who were you there with when you were there in 2012? My dad, his girlfriend Carolyn, my sister Conrad, and my godparents. Okay. And how is it that you came to know Michelle Carter when you were in Naples? Um, my godparents, well, great aunt and uncle, they were friends with her grandparents. Okay. And so did your um, great aunt and uncle and Michelle's grandparents live close to each other in Naples? Yes. How long were you and Conrad and your family at uh, Florida? A week. And when you were there, did you interact with Michelle? Yes. And do you see Michelle present in the courtroom today? Yes. Could you please point to her, identify something she's wearing? A uh, pink jacket. Your Honor. The record will reflect this witness has identified the defendant as the individual she understands to be Michelle Carr. When you were in, in Florida in 2012, uh, how old were you? Uh, 11. And so Conrad would have been 16? Mm -hmm. Do you know or did you know at that time uh, what the age difference was between him and Michelle Carter? Not that I know. And during the time that you and Conrad and your sister were in Florida, did you hang around with Michelle Carter? Yes. And what types of activities did you do? Um, I remember there was one day that we went to like the beach, okay. and she went, she came over to like my great aunt and uncle's like place there. Okay. And did you ever see her and Conrad kind of uh, getting closer together, getting in, in, interacting by themselves during this flip, the trip to Florida? Yeah. What did you observe? Um, I don't know. They were just talking with okay. friends, I guess. 
And at some point when the trip was over, do you know whether or not uh, they kept in contact? Um, not until her grandmother's funeral. Okay. And her grandmother, did you know her grandmother? Yeah, I met her. Okay. So you met her down on that Florida trip? Mm -hmm. Did she also have a place that she lived in Massachusetts? Mm -hmm. Where was that, if you know? I don't remember. Oh, okay. And so how was it that you came to go to her funeral, her grandmother's funeral? Because my great aunt and uncle was friends with her. Okay. So did you go to the funeral uh, with your great aunt and uncle? Mm -hmm. Do you remember the date when it was the funeral? No. July, I think. Do you know what year? 2014, maybe. No, sorry. I just didn't know. So if you met her in February 2012, your brother uh, had passed away in July of 2014. Yeah. Could it have been July of 2013? Yeah, maybe. Okay. I know it was in July. And when you went to the funeral, um, did you see Michelle there? Yes. And who else went to the funeral with you? It was just um, my brother and I and my great aunt and uncle. I'm going to ask you to keep your voice up for us, okay? Um, my brother and I and our great aunt and uncle. Okay. And at some point, um, did your parents divorce? Yes. And when they divorced, did you and your brother and sister continue to live with both parents? Yes. And did Conrad go to school? Yes. Where did he go to high school? Old Rochester Regional okay. High School. And did you see him? Did he play sports there? Um, I know he played like sports, like went out for the high school. Okay. And what type of things did he do? He rode and he played baseball. And who were some of his friends when he was uh, junior, senior in high school? Um, Tom, Louis, and other. Were you pretty close with your brother? Yeah. Did you talk to him about who his girlfriends may or may not have been? <laughs> no. Not okay. Right. So in uh, 2014, say closer to the end of the school year, did you know whether or not he had a girlfriend? No. Had you ever heard him talking about Michelle Carter in 2014? Um, just one time. It was like my cousin's birthday party, so we had a party at my grandparents' house. And since our house is like close to it, Conrad wasn't at the party yet. So my dad asked if me and my cousin could go like find him. And we did. And he was outside my house like on the picnic table. And I saw that he was talking to Michelle because I asked who it was. And like he said, it's Michelle. I said, oh, tell her I said hi. And was that the first time you had even uh, been back in her presence or talking to her since the funeral? Yeah, I don't know. And you said it was your cousin's birthday party? Yeah. What uh, date would it have been? July 10th. What's his birthday? So July 10th, 2014? Mm -hmm. okay. Now, after that period of time, when was the next time you either uh, got contacted yourself from Michelle Carter? or had seen Conrad talking with her? July 12th, I, she texted me. Okay. Now, when she texted you, um, how did you know it was her? She said, like, hello, this is Michelle. Okay. Were you surprised that she had your phone number? Yes. Had you ever given it to her? No. And do you recall if it, on July 12th, if it was the evening or what time it was that she had texted you? It was night time. And after that uh, nighttime text, did you continue to get text messages for, from her the following morning, which would be July 13th? Yes. I'm going to ask you a little bit about July 12th of 2014, okay? Mm -hmm. Do you recall that day? Yeah. And do you recall where you were the morning of the 12th? Um, I was at my mom's house. Who else was there? Um, my sister, my brother. My mom, her boyfriend, and my sister's friend. What was your fr sister's friend's name? Natalie. And what was the plan for that day? What were you all going to do? We were going to go to Horse Neck Beach in Westport. And who was going to the beach? Um, my mom, Conrad, my sister Morgan, Natalie, and my mom's friend. Okay. Did you have, um, did you have breakfast with your brother? Did you see him that morning before you all went to the beach? Not that I remember. Okay. And when you drove to the beach, uh, who drove? My mom. And was everybody in one car? Yes, besides my mom's friend. Okay. She met us there. Where was Conrad sitting? In the passenger seat. So the front passenger seat? Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you see whether or not he had his phone with him? No, but I'm assuming. I'm sorry? No, but I'm assuming. Okay. Um, did you see him texting on his phone at all that morning before you left for the beach? 
Not that I remember. Do you recall if he went somewhere before uh, he went to the beach with you and your and your mom and your sisters? Not that I remember. So when you get to the beach, um, what's his demeanor like? How's he acting? No. Okay. Did you think that he was sad or depressed or anything like that? No. Did he ever say to you that he wanted to hurt himself or harm himself? No. And at some point, um, did he and your mom go off together? Did you see that? Yeah, they took a walk on the beach. Okay. What were you doing when uh, your mom and your brother were off to the beach? I think I was just on my phone. Okay. And while you were at the beach, do you remember Conrad ever leaving and going up to the parking lot area? Yeah. Okay. What do you remember about that? Um, he asked my mom for the keys to the car. Then, like, I went, um, once we were leaving, I went to, like, go to the car also. Okay. And I saw him on, like, the park bench. What was he doing? On his phone. Could you see who he was, was he talking or texting? Texting. Could you see who he was texting? No. And when everybody leaves the beach, uh, how was Conrad's demeanor at that point? Fine. And what time was it, do you recall, that you left the beach? Maybe around like 4.30, 5-ish. Okay. Um, Where did you go from the beach? Um, we were going to go to an ice cream place on the way, but that was like, too many like cars were there, so we went back to my mom's house. Okay. Then he said that he'd bring my sister and I for ice cream. Okay. Now, when you came back to the uh, the house after the beach, did you spend time there, or did you go directly from the house to the ice cream store? I think only like a couple minutes. Okay. And did you see Conrad either go uh, to his truck or do anything before taking you for ice cream? No. And what kind of a truck did he drive? Um, a Ford. What color was it? Like dark, like navy blue or black. Did you ever travel, go places with him in that truck? Yeah. Did he drive you around in the truck? Yeah. Did he have any rosary beads or anything in the truck that you remember? Yeah. Did he always keep those rosary beads in there? Yeah. I think he had like one of them. Okay. I think he had like one rosary bead in there. And where was it in the truck? On the mirror. Okay. And he always had that there? Mm -hmm. Did you ever see um, any, and, and I'm talking about on July 12th, did you ever see any well, were you in his truck at all on July 12th? Not that I remember. Okay. Um, when you went for ice cream, whose car were you in? My mom's. And who went with you to, for ice cream? Um, my sister, her friend, and Conrad and I. What was Conrad's demeanor when you were at the ice cream store? We were fine. We were just like, it was just me and him at the table, and he seemed like good. What were you talking about with him? I don't remember. Did he seem sad at all? No. Did he eat or have any ice cream while he was at the store with you? Yeah, he ate. And how much time did you spend at the ice cream store? Maybe like 30 minutes. Okay. And then you go back to where? My mom's house. What's the plan? Are you staying home that night or are you going out at all? Um, I was stayed home. Okay. And do you recall if Conrad stayed in that night? No, he didn't. What did he do? He um, told us that he was going to his friend Ariana's house. And you know Ariana? Yes. How would you describe their uh, relationship? Good friends. And where does she live? Um, well, Rochester at the time. At the time, Rochester? And was she someone that he would uh, frequently go to visit and stay, hang around with? Yeah. So it didn't seem out of the ordinary to you? Not at all. Uh, when you left, did you see him leave? Mm -hmm. Did he seem upset to you? No, he was just like, I'm going to Ariana's. Bye. And did he leave with anything? Did you see anything in his hands? Not that I remember. Was that the last time you saw your brother? Yeah. And so later on that night, that's when you get the text message from Michelle Carter? I'm now going to ask you about the 13th. Do you recall getting a text message from Michelle Carter? Yes. I'm going to go over some, just a few of those text messages with you, okay? Okay. I'm going to direct your attention to uh, text number 84, which is on July 13th, 2014 at 10.23 a.m. 
to recall getting a text message from a Michelle Carter that said, find him yet. Mm -hmm. And you replied back, no. And then shortly after at 1028 AM, Michelle Carter texted you, okay, just stay positive, let me know. You recall that? Mm -hmm. Had she told you that she was with him at all that night? No. Direct your attention now to text number 62, again on July 13th, 2014, at now 2.23 p.m. Do you recall getting a text message from a Michelle Carter where she says, did you call the police yet? Yes. On July 14th, text number 51, at 12.35 p.m., do you recall getting a text message from Michelle Carter saying, hey, love, Please talk to me if you need to. I want to do everything I can to help you and your family through this very difficult time. Is there any way I can come over tomorrow? Do you recall that? Yeah. Had she ever been to your house before that you recall? No. And after your brother uh, passed, there were services for him? Mm-hmm. Do you recall whether she attended those services? Yes. Did you see her there? Yeah. Did she speak to you at all? Yeah, I think I just, like, gave her a hug. Did she ever tell you that she had been on the phone with your brother that night? No. After 8 o'clock, 7 o'clock? No. I'm going to direct your attention again to text number 10 on July 17th of 2014. This would be about two days before the services. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Do you recall getting a text message from uh, Michelle Carter after you had told her that his body was cremated? She replied to you, oh, I didn't know, I'm sorry, it's um, text number nine on July 17, 2014, 9.47 p.m. She replied to you, oh, I didn't know that, so there's not going to be a casket or a grave site, and those are beautiful and perfect places to spread his ashes. I know you probably don't want me to, but I'm, am I allowed to have some or no? I completely understand if you don't want me to. Do you yes. recall that? Yes. Did you think that was odd? Um. Were you concerned by that? Hello. Did you continue to hear from Michelle Carter uh, after that Not summer? Much. When you uh, were at, staying at your mom's house, do you have access to computers? Mm hmm And what types of computers are at your mom's? Uh, we have a, like, iMac. Okay. Is that like a desktop type of computer? Yes. Not a laptop? Yeah. Okay. And does everybody in the family, when they're there, have access to use that? Yes. And is there, well, let me ask you this. Um, although the communication with Michelle might have stopped sometime after the services, um, was there an event that she had that you and your family went to? Yeah. And when was that? Um, September 13th. Okay. And what was that that you went to? Uh, Homer's for Conrad. Where was it? Plainville. And are you familiar with Plainville? No. Um, did you think it was odd or we, did you think it was funny that it was up in Plainville rather than in Mattapoiset? Yeah. And did you, did, did you go? Yes. Okay. And how many people were there about? I don't know. Okay. Did you know any of them? Yeah, my family. Okay. So you and your family, did you know any of the other people that were there? Yeah, Conrad's friends. So Conrad's friends and your family. Yeah. Um, was Michelle Carter there with her family? I know she was there. I don't know about her family. Did you speak with her on that day? Yeah. Okay. And did she ever mention anything about what she had been talking to or had she been co talking to Conrad about? I don't remember. Sustained. Did she give any type of a speech or, or address the crowd that was there? I don't Sorry, can I have a question again? I just asked whether or not she gave a speech when at the Homer's for Conrad. Overruled. Give me the answer to that. I don't remember. Okay. And uh, how long were you at uh, that event? Pretty much like the whole day. Did you play on one of the teams? Yes. And so after that, I'm now going to ask you about um, the computer again. 
So when you're at your mom's house, and this would be in Fairhaven, mm -hmm. now when you're um, using the computer, do you have to get any type of password to get on, or can you access the, the desktop? Yeah, there's a password. Okay. And so when you're uh, sometime after that Homer's for Conrad, which was in September of 2014, mm -hmm. uh, was there something on the computer that attracted your attention? Yeah. What did you see? Um, I was like looking in the trash bin on it, and you can see like all the things that were put into the trash, and I saw a video of him. So you were looking in the trash, and you could see all the things that had been deleted from the computer, mm -hmm. and you saw something um, that you noted, you saw it was Conrad? Yeah. How could you tell it was Conrad? I saw his face. Okay. And did you click on it? Yeah. And what was it? A video of him talking to the computer. And once you saw that, uh, what did you do? I got my mom. And at some point, you know, your mom gave that to the police? Yes. Your Honor, at this point, I'd like to play that video, please. Is this the video that was attached to one of the motions? Yes. And I reviewed the video already, and in consideration of the motion, what is the purpose in playing that here in the courtroom again? I found the finer fact. Can it not just be admitted as an exhibit? Judge, I think that uh, at this point, I'd like to have her authenticate it, and I'd like. Well, is there a question of authentication? No, we will. You may admit it as an exhibit. All right, if you knock, whatever the next number is, I think eight. Number eight, yes, sir. Number Did uh, your brother Conrad have a Facebook page? Yes. And after he passed away, um, were you able to maintain his Facebook page? Yes. And how were you able to do that? Um, I, like, he already had his email, lock, like, logged in on the computer, so I, like, reset his password. Okay, so you were able to post to his his Facebook page? Yes. And you were also able to see uh, postings from or to his Facebook page? Mm -hmm. Was there a posting that you saw um, from Michelle Carter? Yes. And when you saw that, did that concern you? Yeah. Well, um, which one? Let me ask. Okay. You seen that, sir? Yes. Okay. I'm going to show you something and ask you if you want to read it briefly to yourself and see if that refreshes your recollection. Yeah. Okay. So you recall uh, reading that Facebook posting mm -hmm. and it was from Michelle Carter yes. posted to your uh, brother's Facebook page. Mm -hmm. And the date of that would be July 14, 2014 at 13, so 1.17 in the afternoon. You recognize that? Mm -hmm. Is there an objection? <laughs> we did put the disc in, right? Or is that coming in now? We gave it to you already. Right. This is a different one, Your Honor. Sorry. Okay. Number nine. Just one moment, please, Your Honor. Okay. Nothing further, thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. do you wish to inquire? I would just, this, again, the disk <coughs> messages. No, the text messages are referenced. Okay. And that's the mark that we give it a go. Thank you, Judge. Ms. Lynn, the one that you're putting in now, what, which text message is these between the ones that we just this over. young lady and Ms. Carter? Yes. So okay, so that's, that's going to be 10. Is there an objection to that exhibit? I'm sorry, which one? This is the one of communications between the Ms. Big Carter. No, the one, the, the disc, the text of this one. That she has testified oh, oh, to about yes. this. No objection to that. All right, and then may come in. That's whatever the next number is. 10, please, Judge. Thank you. One moment. 
Ms. Roy, on um, July 12th at 1018 p.m., you received a text from Michelle Carter? Yes. And she asked you where uh, your brother was? Yes. Is that right? And she also told you that she was getting a little worried, didn't she? Yes. And you then conferred with your mom. Mm -hmm. Is that yes? Yes. Yeah. Sorry, you got it. Sorry. And then after conferring with your mom, you sent Michelle a text back that said, he's at my dad's house, so I called my dad, and he said he is sleeping right now. That's what you sent back to Michelle, didn't you? Yes. And now, uh, at some point in time after your brother had passed, you found some notebooks of his? Yes. Okay. And where did you find these uh, notebooks? Um, I think in, like, the drawer in his desk. And where, which house? My dad's house. Okay. May I approach you, Anna? You may. I'd show you those uh, three notebooks. Are those the ones you found in your brother's draw? I don't know. There's a... I'm sorry? If you can... I think so. I don't know. If you take a look at them, please. Take your time. In those of uh, your brother's notebooks, you recognize them? Yes. This time I'd be asking to mark those as exhibits. Yes, please. Yes. Okay. Judge, many of those uh, notebooks are not yours. Are they dated? And so I don't know what the offer of proof would be as to why they're relevant. Why oh, they're relevant to all of them? There are in, within those notebooks are what I would categorize as suicide notes, goodbye letters to his mother, his father, his sisters, and the letter that I uh, showed at opening statement, a letter to Michelle Carter thanking her and saying goodbye to her. I have no objection to the letter to Michelle Carter coming in. It's just the other ones are not dated. And as we know, there were previous suicide attempts, so it could have been for a different time period. It, I would suggest even... Let me inquire. Ms. Roy, um, you found these in a desk drawer in your brother's room in your father's home. Is that correct? Yes. Your parents separated in 2011, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Now, in 2011, your father did not have that home, correct? He did. He did have that home? Yes. Okay. And your brother, Conrad, would have had this desk in his home, in that home prior to 2011? Yes. I certainly understand the relevance of the, the suicide notes, 
but as to the general contract, I have no idea what's in there and how it could be relevant to these proceedings. <coughs> I mean, is there any references therein, Mr. Picaldo, to Mr. Uh, Roy's communications with Ms. Carter? <coughs> I mean, I what? It says to Michelle. I mean, you, I mean, you mentioned the left, but yes, to, I can, that left. I can go there, one in. Is there a discussion of his relationship with Ms. Carter, which may be relevant to uh, the degree to which you would attach significance to what Ms. Carter might suggest? Is there anything but, there that creates can, a nexus to this case? Yeah, I mean, I can read it as an offer well, of proof. Well, I don't to read it because then I, it's a... Uh, it, well, it's... Uh, it, what it, I what I would like you to do is to go through and see if you can agree to a redaction of the records of those notebooks. They have been, to my mind, sufficiently authenticated by this witch. So you can go through them and then present them tomorrow. See if you can come to the floor and I'll figure it out. Thank you. All right? Thank you. Any redirect? No, oh, I'm yes. sorry. Yes, there is. Okay. Um, Ms. Roy, you were asked about the text that you had sent back to Michelle Carter on, on Saturday evening about um, Conrad being at your dad's. Yeah. Uh, was that, in fact, true? No, I lied. And why did, you, why did you lie about that? Because he said that he was going to his friend Ariana's house, which, who's a girl, so I didn't know like, how she'd feel. Because she told you in the text previous that she was now his girlfriend? Yes. And so what did you do? You went and talked to your mom? Yeah. What did your mom say? Just uh, that. Objection. After, t after talking to your mom, what did you then reply to Michelle? Um, that he was at my dad's house. But you know he wasn't at your dad's house. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Just on that point, Your Honor. Anything? And in that text, you specifically told Michelle Carter you spoke to your dad, and your dad told you he was sleeping. He being the Conrad dad. III. That would be Conrad II. Oh, so, so, so to be clear about that. I want to be clear about Yeah, that. no, you're right. There. <laughs> All right. So Michelle had inquired by a text to you, do you know where your brother is? Mm -hmm. And she was concerned. Is that right? She said she was worried. Yeah. And then you responded, I, something to the effect, I spoke with my dad, and my dad said, Conrad's over there sleeping. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, anything further, Ms. Flynn? No, Your Honor, thank you. Uh, you may step down, Mr. Roy. Thank you for your assistance in this case. Tom, I'll have a further. Thank you, Your Honor. Tom Gamble, please. All right. <laughs> Oh, yes. Could you, uh, could you hand those to one of the lawyers as you go by, please, Ms. Roy? Thank you very much. Good afternoon, sir. Please raise your hand. Tonight, before the court, swear testimony will adhere to the truth of his case and nothing else will be subject to. Yes. Mr. Sufis? Please take a seat, sir, and keep your voice nice and loud. <clears throat> and when you are subtle and comfortable, please state your full name and spell your last name for the record. <clears throat> My name is Thomas Gamble. Gamble is G A M M E L L. All right. You may proceed, counsel. Thank when you. Are ready. Good afternoon, Mr. Gamble. Good afternoon. How old are you? I'm 22. And uh, did you just finish college? I did. Where'd you graduate from? Fitchburg State. What's your major? Business management. And uh, what are you doing right now? I just got a job in property management. And where is that going to take you? Where are you going to be working? Uh, Boston. When do you start that? Uh, tomorrow. Okay. And uh, you, did you go to Fitchburg all four years? Yes. And when you went to Fitchburg, where did you live? Off campus. Where did you grow up? Mattapoisett. When did you, did you, were you born in Mattapoisett or did you move there at some point? Uh, I was born in North Providence. I moved to Mattapoisett 
when I was about eight. And when you, after you moved to Mattapoisett, did you meet someone by the name of Conrad Roy III? Yes. And what did you call him? My friend, best friend. And how long, you were, said you moved here when you were around eight, how long had you lived here when you became friends with Conrad? Only a couple of years. What types of things do you guys do together? We played sports. What type of sports? Baseball, basketball, football. How uh, far apart were your two houses? A couple miles. Did you go to the same school, the grammar school? Yes. And uh, as you continue to get older, third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, did your friendship continue? Yes. And at some point, did you go to different high schools? Yes. What high school did you go to? I went to Old Colony. And uh, is that a uh, vo-tech, uh, vocational school? Yes. And to your knowledge, what uh, high school did your friend Conrad go to? Old Rochester. After you guys went to two separate high schools, did you continue to stay in touch? Yes. How'd you do that? Um, what types of things would you do together? Play basketball, baseball, that kind of stuff. And during the school year, um, how often would you guys see each other? Very often. And how about in the summertime? Often. Do you ever go over his house? Yep. And did there come a time when you learned that uh, his mom and his dad were living at two separate houses? Yes. And when that happened, uh, where would you usually see him? His mom's house or his dad? Or both? Kind of both. And did you have an opportunity to observe his relationship with his uh, little sisters? Yes. And what, it, what observations did you make of him, his relationship with his sisters? Um, he loved them very much. And uh, of his two parents, who would you say you observed him to be closer to, his mom or his dad? His mom. Now, as uh, Conrad got older and as you got older, um, did there come a time when he, you saw signs that he might be um, kind of shy or socially reserved more so than maybe you? Yes. And at what age did you begin to notice that about your friend, that he was maybe a little quieter or a little bit more anxious in public than you? High school. And uh, did he ever, just yes or no, did he ever talk to you about the fact that he might have some social anxiety? Yes. And did you sort of talk to him about that as well? Mm hmm And although you guys went to two separate high schools, did he ever talk to you about his relationship with girls? Yes. Do you talk about that a lot or just sometimes? Just sometimes. Did you ever meet his girlfriend, Catherine Ball? I did not. Did he ever talk about her with you? Not much. How about Michelle Carter? Did you ever hear the name Michelle Carter prior to your friend's death? No. And um, drawing your attention to the end of June or June of 2014, did there come a time when Conrad came to visit you at Fitchburg? Yes. And what was going to be the plan relative to him visiting or staying with you? Uh, he was going to stay up for the summer, and then he was going to enroll in the fall. Were you already attending Fitchburg at that time, sir? Yes. And what types of things did you go have going on that summer? Were you going to be working or um, playing sports? Yeah, I was working for the school. And what kinds of things were you doing for the school? Uh, do, like ground screw stuff. And where was Conrad going to be living that summer? What was the plan? At my apartment. Was he going to have his own room or share a room with you? He was going to have his own room. How many other guys lived there other than you and hopefully Conrad? For the summer, it was just me and one other. And after he got up there or was going to move in with you, did you see him? Like, did he come and check in with you and say, hey, I'm staying or whatever? After one. When he got there, did you sort of hang around with him for a couple of days after he got to Fitchburg? Yeah. Okay. And did there come a time after a few days passed that he maybe didn't seem like he wanted to stay as much? Yes. Can you tell the court a little bit about that, please? Um, basically, he said he was homesick. He wanted to go home. Did Conrad have a cell phone? Yes. And uh, was that how, other than when he came to visit you, did, is that how you guys usually communicated via cell phone? Yes. And after he told you that he was homesick, what happened next, Tom? He went home. <coughs> and after he went home, did you talk to him at all? Mm-hmm. And tell us about that. What, types of, uh, what type of communication did you guys have after he left? Just mostly through text message. And drawing your attention now to the time frame of July 12th of 2014 to July 13th, 2014, um, specifically the 13th, did someone contact you about whether or not if you knew where Conrad was? Yes. Okay. Who contacted you first, Tom? First was his mom, I believe. And at that point, did you have any knowledge of where your friend was? No. Do you remember when the last time you had talked to him in relation to the 13th was? I can't remember. And, uh, after you spoke to his mom, do you remember talking to anybody else? Yes. Who else did you talk to? A uh, police officer called me and Ariana Taylor. 
And uh, tell us about Ariana Taylor. Uh, did you know who she was? Yes. And who was she? She's a friend of Conrad's. Had you met her through Conrad? Yes. And um, how many times do you think you met Ariana? A handful, probably five. Did you have a friendship with uh, Ms. Taylor independent of sort of being friends with her through your friend? No. And after you spoke with the police officer and Ariana, was it your understanding whether or not Conrad had been found yet? No. Okay. How did you learn what had happened to him? Uh, Ariana called me. And after Ariana called you at some later time, did you become aware that there was a wake and a funeral and that type of thing for your friend? Yes. Now I'm going to fast forward a little bit to September of 2014, okay? Um, do you have Facebook or did you have Facebook back then? Yes. How active were you on Facebook, sir? Fairly active. And uh, would you use it, um, would you do instant messages as well as read people's public postings, that sort of thing? Yes. And did there come a time in September 2014 that you learned either from Facebook yourself or someone else seeing it in Facebook that someone had a page um, dedicated to homers for Conrad? Yes. How did you become aware of that, Tom? Um, I think it just popped up because I, I was friends with Conrad on Facebook, so he was tagged in it. Okay. What does tagging mean? Um, basically, you put somebody's name and it links you to their page. And had, were you friends with Conrad Roy prior to his death on Facebook? Yes. So when this Homers for Conrad pops up, is there any contact information for who's running this Homers for Conrad? Yes. And what was the name? Michelle. Did that name mean anything to you at that time? No. So what did you do? I contacted her. And how did you contact her? Facebook. And uh, did you have a back and forth with, Ms., with someone identified as Michelle on Facebook? Yes. And ultimately, did that lead you to contact someone by the name of Michelle Carter via text message or by phone? Yes. And tell us how, what precipitated that. Why did you text her um, on her phone? Um, I was curious as to why the torment was being held in Plainville and not in Mattapoisett. Why were you curious about that? Because all of Conrad's family and friends are from Mattapoisett. And did you then text a phone number associated with Michelle Carter to make inquiry as to who she was and why the Homers for Conrad was going to be in Plainville and not Mattapoisett. Yes. And did the person, uh, Michelle Carter, respond to you on the other end of the line? Yes. Tell us, please tell the court about the conversation, the text messages between you and Ms. Uh, Ms. Carter about Homers for Conrad. Um. I'll hear you as to the relevant issue. Absolutely, Your Honor. I would suggest your, what uh, he's going to describe. And, was only going to show a few text messages is that when um, Mr. Gamble suggests that the um, Homers for Conrad for Conrad Roy's for Mattapoisett is in Plainville, the defendant becomes upset and then suggests that um, Mr. Gamble is trying to get, take credit for her idea. She says, um, okay, awesome, thank you. You're not taking credit for my idea, right? All and right, that right. I think the it goes to the thank you. Question. What did you guys talk about on, on uh, this conversation? Um, Basically, first asked why I was in Plainville. Um, she just said that she set up there and she's running the whole thing. Um, and we just kind of went back and forth on that. Um, and then she, when I kept asking about it, she wanted to make clear that she was getting credit for all this, which I had no problem with. If I could, Your Honor, just show a couple of text messages of this group, please, uh, with the court's permission. 34, please. Um, strike that. So, uh, August 27, 2014, at 12:47 p.m., number 36. Okay. <clears throat> On August 27, 2014, at 12:47 p.m., do you recall getting a text message that I actually just said to the judge? But, okay, awesome. Thank you. You're not taking credit for my idea, right? LOL. Do you recall getting that? Yes. And then just one more. Number 34. Um, up one more. Oh, so it's double. Did you also remember getting text message on August 27, 2014? Um, ha ha, well, I mean, I'm hosting. It was like my idea, but you're like my co-captain now. Do you recall getting that? Yes. And were you, and I won't go through all of them, sir, but were you willing to give Ms. Carter the credit for throwing this, uh, um, did you, Argue with her that she, whether or not she could have credit for it? Nope. 
Did you relate to her that you thought it made more sense to have it in Mattapoisett where Conrad's friends and family were? Yes. And how did she respond to you wanting, suggesting that maybe it should be moved to be more convenient for his friends and family? She wasn't willing to move it. Given that she wasn't willing to move it, sir, what did you do? I went to the tournament. And did you organize a team, sir? I did. And can you tell us a little bit about the um, Homers for Conrad, please? Um, I got a team full of guys I go to school with at Fitchburg together, um, and we played in the tournament. Did uh, another friend by the name of Louie, um, one of Conrad's other friends, did he have a team as well? Yes. And approximately of all the people at the, this benefit or Homers for Conrad, how many people would you say you actually knew? About half. Okay. And uh, what would you consider your relationship to Conrad to have been? Was he your, uh, would you say he was just a friend or was he your best friend? He was my best friend. Okay. And for how long was he your best friend? Five or so years. Okay. And you only knew half of the people at a benefit for him? Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, were there some photographs taken? Yes. How did your team do? We won. If I may approach your honor. May. Thank you. And at some point, did Ms. Carter ask that her photograph be taken with some of the teams? Yes. Okay. Leading. Leading. Yes. Okay. And is that a photograph, sir? Yes. And is that a fair and accurate depiction of a team photo with your team uh, having one and Ms. Carter in the middle? Yes. Your Honor, I would ask that it be marked, please. Is there an objection? No. May be marked. And just for the record, oops, sorry, I'm just going to and just switch back over to the Where are you? Behind her to the right. Right there? Yes. <coughs> so for the record, you are, uh, you're behind Ms. Carter. Yes. And this is your team and your trophies, correct? Yes. Thank you. How would you describe Ms. Carter's demeanor throughout Homer's for Conrad? Um, she seemed very happy. I could have one moment, please, Your Honor? Yes. Facebook, sir, uh, do you recall, were you friends with Ms. Carter on Facebook? I believe so, yeah. Okay. And um, when, um, after Conrad passed away, did you, other than noticing the homers for Conrad um, banner or whatever you want to call it on Facebook, did you notice any other postings about Conrad by the defendant, Michelle Carter? Yes. What else did you see, sir? Um, she's putting up a bunch of pictures saying that he was like her angel and Stuff like that. Um, and did you see those around the same time as you saw the, the uh, advertisement for Homer's for Conrad or were those at sort of two separate times? All around the same time. And who was in those pictures, the, the pictures that appeared to be posted by someone by the name of Michelle Carter? Just Conrad. Thank you. Your Honor, I, at this time I uh, move to introduce the CD of the text message between the defendant and uh, this witness that I went over a couple of them. Your objections. Thank you. 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 Thank isn't it true that on October 10th of 2012 that Michelle Carter reached out to you and had a Facebook conversation with you? I believe so. Okay. And she asked you how Conrad was? I have no idea. About when Conrad had tried to kill himself in 2012 when he was just out of the hospital in early October. Okay, yep. And in fact, she said, 
you told her that he's doing a lot better now, but he was in the hospital for a week. You filled her in on what had gone on with him, did yep. you? And she said, I know, but he told me he was going to kill himself last night. Is he okay? Remember her telling you this? I don't remember that. Do you remember saying, I don't know, I haven't talked to him since yesterday afternoon. What time did you talk to him? Do you remember any of that? No. But you did in 2012 when Conrad had tried to take his own life, speak to Michelle. Yes. And she told you that she was concerned about it. Yes. And then in 2013, August 23rd of 2013, you recall Michelle, hey Tom, I just wanted to thank you for helping Conrad today. He's really important friend, you're a really important friend to him and I know you really got through to him and helped him, so thank you so much. Remember that? Yes. And you said, no need to thank me, just trying to be a good friend, that's all. And Michelle, And Michelle asked you, you're being a great friend, and yeah, I believe in him. I know he will get through this with our help and support and his family help and support. Just wish he could have told me earlier so I can make plans with other people. And Michelle responded, yeah, I know. I'm sorry, Tom. He's losing his memory. Remember having these conversations with her? Yes. Didn't you just testify 10 minutes ago on direct examination? You didn't have any of communications with Michelle Cotter? I don't remember. Just 10 minutes ago to the court, didn't, did my sister ask you if you knew who Michelle Cotter was and you, well, you communicated? What was the date? What's that? What was the date on when she asked if I knew her? Okay. So my point is, Michelle Cotter had reached out to you in 2013 and told you that she was concerned about Conrad Roy taking his life, didn't she? Yes. And you then, in turn, reached out and spoke to your friend Conrad. Yes. Okay. And she did this, would it be fair to say, a number of times throughout 2013? I can't remember. Several times? More than once? I can't remember. Do you remember whether or not she did this in August? In August 26th of 2013. Do you remember? No. Nope. Do you remember if she did it again in September of 2013? No. Were you communicating with Michelle Carter via Facebook in 2013? Yes. Do you remember what those conversations were about? Probably about Conrad's well-being, yeah. About his mental health and about his suicidal thoughts? Yep. Nothing further, Your Honor. All right. Can you redirect? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. So Michelle Carter knew how to get a hold of you. Right? Yes. Yes. And Michelle Carter knew that you would help your friend if he needed your help. Yes. So if Michelle Carter and you guys, you were friends with this defendant in, on July 12th of 2014, correct? Yes. And the 11th and the 10th and the 9th and the 8th, correct? Yes. And this defendant, by what counsel has just read, knew that if she reached out to you... Objection, Your Honor. Sustained. Okay. Based on the conversations you've just heard read back to you, uh, did you make it clear when you were speaking to Michelle Carter or whoever was on the other end of Facebook that if Conrad needed your help, you would help him? Yes. And in July of 2014, were you still friends with Conrad? Yes. And did this defendant, from July 1st, 2014, to when you found out your best friend had died in a car, did she ever do the same thing she had done in the past and reach out to you and ask you to help your friend? No. <laughs> Nothing further. Well, uh, Nothing further. Ms. Ross? Yes. <clears throat> in uh, 2014, in uh, June and July, you were in contact with Conrad Roy. Yes. Right? And um, you spoke to him in person. Yes. And you also spoke to him via electronic communications? Yes. Okay, was that by text? 
Yes. Also Snapchat? Yes. And um, Conrad Roy never told you that somebody was pressuring him to commit suicide? No. Okay. Nothing further. All right. We're all set. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, you may step down. Thank you for your assistance in this case. You are free to go. If no one has any concern, this witness remaining, correct? Absolutely not. Free to go. Thank you. Do you have a further witness? Your Honor, may we approach this briefly? You may. Thank you. Paul Bartlett to the stand, please, Your Honor. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Please remain standing for a moment. Thank you very much, Ann. Mr. Madden, before the court, this is your testimony about to give to you the truth, no truth, and nothing but the truth. I beg your pardon. I do. All right. Please take a seat. Make yourself nice and comfortable. Keep your voice up nice and loud. And when you are settled and comfortable, please state your full name and spell your last name for the record. Sir, my name is uh, Paul Bartlett. It's B-A-R-T-L-E-T-T. -T. All right. You may proceed, Mr. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you currently employed? I'm a trooper with the Massachusetts State Police. And how long have you been there? Uh, 18 years now. And what is your current assignment? I'm currently assigned in the Foxborough Barracks. What do you do there? I'm a patrol officer. I work on the highway. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, sir, did you have another assignment? I did, yes. Tell us about that. I was assigned in the Crime Scene Services section located in Lakeville, Massachusetts. How long did you hold that position? I was uh, in the Crime Scene Unit for 14 years, just under 14 years. Mm -hmm. And do you have any training that goes along with being in the Crime Scene Services Unit? Yes, I do. Please tell us about that. When you are brought on as a member of the Crime Scene Unit, you go through a six-month in-house training program. Uh, basically, you are taught uh, photography. Uh, a lot of it focuses on fingerprints. You're taught videography, uh, crime scene diagram techniques, evidence identification, evidence collection, evidence processing, and uh, report writing skills, basically. And... Uh, in working in crime scene services, do you keep a regular schedule, sort of a Monday through Friday thing? It typically, it's Monday through Friday, and you're also on a, subject to an on-call schedule as well. Okay. So tell us about the on-call. Uh, basically, it depends on how many people work in the particular office that you're in. I worked with uh, nine troopers, so we were on call essentially every nine days, and then the weekends would rotate. So every ninth weekend, you would be on call from 7 in the morning on Saturday through 7 in the morning on Monday, so a 48-hour shift. And what does being on call entail? It means you are responsible for any calls for service from local towns, local cities, uh, sometimes federal agencies, and in most cases state agencies, to respond to calls for service anytime they require your assistance. And what could that involve? Give us a sort of a, um, you know, to include all of them, but sort of what would that involve as far as cases or types of crime scenes? Well, uh, th the cases that were in involved would be anything where they needed photographic evidence of a particular scene. Most times they involve some sort of a death investigation. However, they, they could involve uh, a traffic accident where there was serious injury. It could involve a house fire. It could involve uh, search warrants being executed somewhere. But probably 90% of the time it involves some sort of a, a death investigation. And how do you get called out as the on-call crime scene trooper? I will be called from the duty office, of the, the, basically the troop headquarters of whatever troop is requesting the assistance. Uh, in most cases, it would have come from the D troop headquarters, which is located in Middleborough. And if the state police crime scene uh, unit is being um, dispatched, does that also usually mean that there's going to be a trooper from a CPAC unit or a, uh, a troop sent as well? That's right. Uh, typically what will happen is a, a local PD or a local city will contact the duty office. The duty office will in turn then turn around and contact um, a representative from the district attorney's office, a trooper from the district attorney's office, and uh, I will I'll usually get that call at the same time. And with regard to that, sir, could you please explain to the court a little bit about how the local police and the CPAC unit, or now that's the old acronym, but in this case the Bristol County District Attorney's Office troopers, how they will work an investigation together, sort of how does that work? 
Basically, all, all deaths need to be reported, all deaths that are outside of a hospital need to be reported to the district attorney's office. So the district attorney's office has troopers anywhere from uh, 10 to, in some cases, 20 troopers who are assigned to the district attorney's office, and that's what they do. They investigate uh, deaths sort of all over that particular county. And the reason that's done is basically to streamline it, because many in many communities, you won't, you'll, you'll go a long time in between deaths, uh, between someone who dies of an overdose or someone who just dies in their home, something like that. And basically the district attorney's office, the representatives from them will sort of just help them along and sort of speed up the process. And um, as uh, an individual who e either takes video or pictures or do you sometimes also do um, like charts and things of that nature as the well? Diagrams, yes. Diagrams. Mm -hmm. um, are you then called out on uh, all sorts of unattended deaths, meaning anything from a potential suicide all the way up to a homicide? Yes. Okay. And are different uh, um, sort of amounts of crime scene services people dispatch depending on what type of call it is? Depending upon the type of call, depending upon the, the scope of the scene, if there's one scene, if there's multiple scenes, then yes, that might require more people. In this particular case, now talking about here, drawing your attention to July 13th of 2014, were you on call? I was, yes. And were you asked to go assist a uh, local, uh, meaning Fairhaven uh, Police Department, with an investigation? Yes, I was. And upon getting that call, sir, where did you go? I responded to, uh, it was the Camart Plaza on Route 6 in Fairhaven. Mm -hmm. And when you arrived, sir, can you tell us whether or not any uh, local guys were on scene already? When I arrived, um, I was given the location of just the parking lot in the Camart. And when I arrived, I, I had a hard time finding them. Um, it was sort of the middle of a, I believe it was a Sunday afternoon, and uh, the Camart was open. It was obviously quite crowded. So I had to drive around for a little while, and then I, eventually I drove around the back and I did locate the Fairhaven police officers, yes. Okay, so you knew you were going to a crime scene, and you, you yourself still had difficulty finding the car that the victim was in. Strike I did. That, that, the, at, that Conrad was in. I apologize for using the inappropriate word, Your Honor. That Conrad was in. That's correct, yes. And how long did you, would you say you drove around for? Uh, probably five minutes. And after about five minutes, did you find where you were going to? I did. And uh, where did you go in relation to the Kmart? I went around, the Kmart I believe faces north. I went around the east, then traveled, uh, well, to the traveling south, then I traveled to the west, and that's when, as I came around the corner, on the west side of the building, that's when I located them. And did you see whether or not, and, and what did you locate? What was there? I believe there was two, well, one marked Fairhaven Police Cruiser, one unmarked cruiser, and then there was some crime scene tape set up. And uh, did you do something? Uh, I did. What'd you do? I uh, well, I made contact with the uh, the investigators, introduced myself, um, and I basically took photographs of the scene. Now, um, sir, and, and I believe we've looked at um, with Exhibit Six some of your photographs. What is your job from crime scene in relation to taking photographs versus the local guys who are also taking photographs? Will there sometimes be both sets of people taking photographs? Sometimes, not always. Um, sometimes I will get there and a. a Photographs will already have been taken. Sometimes a, a police officer will wait for me and he'll ask if he can sort of shadow me and take the same pictures. Sometimes they won't take any pictures at all. It's just there is no hard and fast rule as to how it's done. But in this particular case, sir, you, even if anyone else was taking pictures, you yourself took pictures. That's correct. In what parts of the vehicle or the, the of, or Conrad, who was, was, was the deceased still on scene when you were there? Yes, he was. And where was he situated when you were there? He was sitting in the driver's seat. Mm -hmm. And... Um, mm -hmm. Did you, in addition to noting, obviously, the deceased there, did you note any other items in the car? In the car, um, just sort of miscellaneous items, though I believe there were some tools in the back seat. It was a, a pickup truck, sort of an extended cab pickup truck. Not a quad cab, not a four-door truck, but just an extended cab. And there were some, uh, some tools, um, I believe there was some clothing. Nothing, and, nothing that really jumped out. And did you ever see a water pump? Yes. I could borrow, Madam Clerk, can I borrow the exhibits, if I may, Your Honor, uh, publish the previously marked exhibits? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So showing you uh, what is part of Exhibit 6, sir, um, do you recognize that item? I do, yes. And what did that look like to you? I, I believed at the time it to be a generator, but I, I later, looking at it closer, we determined it was a water pump, yes. And what is, and you saw it, so what is a water pump, or what did you see when you looked at it? 
Uh, basically, a water pump is something that uh, you would attach your hose to this particular motor. You would put a hose in an area that was flooded or something you wanted to remove water from. You would attach a separate hose and leave the water out. You'd start the motor. It would pump the water from where you wanted to remove it out to where you wanted it to go. And um, are you aware, based on your experience of having been to other scenes, what does water pump, what does it take in and what does it admit, if you know? Uh, it's my understanding that it's, uh, it needs oxygen to, to burn. It's a combustion engine. It requires oxygen in order to run, and it emits carbon monoxide. Mm -hmm. And, sir, um, have you um, been to scenes where other individuals have died from carbon monoxide poisoning? Yes, I have. And have you ever noticed about their bodies, is there anything distinctive about, about the people after they have passed as a result of carbon monoxide poisoning? In my experience, yes. And what is that? The skin begins to turn a, uh, a sort of a bright red color. In, in this particular case, did you make any such observations about the body of Conrad Roy? I did, yes. With regard to the truck itself, what would you describe its overall condition to be? A clean, kind of messy, very messy? Do you mean the interior? The interior, yeah. The interior, um, I would say it was somewhat messy. It certainly wasn't the worst car I've ever seen, but it wasn't the tidiest car I'd ever seen either. And how long did you stay on scene, sir? I was probably there for an hour and a half, hour and a half to two hours, I would say. And in addition to officers from Fairhaven arriving, was there a trooper who uh, a, arrived as well? Yes. And who would that be? Uh, I believe it was Trooper Collins. Mm -hmm. And did you know Trooper Collins? Did you know where he was from? From the Bristol, Bristol County District Attorney's Office, yes. And after you left the scene, sir, uh, after you'd taken your photographs, did that essentially ends your role with regard to that, this particular investigation? Yes, it did. Nothing further. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dowdle, any questions, sir? Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. You took uh, photographs of the scene? Yes. Do you have those with you today? No, I don't. And where are they? Uh, I believe the district attorney's office has some, and the others will be in the case file at, uh, located in Lakeville. May I see, uh, Madam Clerk, the um, photos that were marked for identification, please? May I approach witness? May. I ask you to take a look at those two photographs. Those photos um, that you took? I believe so, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Your Honor, at this time, I'd ask that they uh, go into evidence. Well, let's establish the connection to this. Uh, this oh, all right. These photos that you took of uh, the interior of the cab when Conrad Roy uh, was deceased, still in the cab of the truck? Yes. Okay. All right. Is there an objection? No, Your Honor. They may be, you want to mark collectively or separately? Um, collectively, please. All right. They may be marked with the next exhibit. Uh, Whichever is easier for the clerk. Thank you. And, um, Trooper, how many um, carbon monoxide deaths have you been uh, dealt with? D directly or indirectly? It, the uh, reason I ask is, okay. uh, right. as far as responding to, I would put it at probably a dozen. However, as a trooper assigned to the crime scene unit in Lakeville, we often have to sit in on autopsies that are performed uh, at the medical examiner's office in Sandwich. So while I may not have responded to a scene, I may photograph an autopsy. It was a, so I will have done more autopsies than I would have actually responded to scenes. And were they all uh, suicides? I believe, yes. I don't believe any more, anything What's that? else. I don't believe any of them were anything else. That's correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Nothing further. Can you read your Can I have one minute, Your Honor? Of course. Okay. Nothing further. Thank you. All right. Cooper, thank you very much for your assistance in this case. You're free to go, sir. Thank you, sir. All right. Well, I have another four, I do. Lieutenant Walter Therian, please, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Trooper.
afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Please remain standing for a moment while you are sworn. Please raise your right hand. This matter before the court is for a testimony about to get through the truth, the truth, and none of the truth shall be heard. I do. Thank you. All right. Take a seat. Make yourself nice and comfortable. Keep your voice up nice and loud for the benefit of everyone in the room. And when you are settled and comfortable, state your full name. Tell your last name for the record. My full name is Wally Charles Therian. T-H-E-R-R-I-E-N. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Um, how are you employed? Well, I'm retired now, but I was a lieutenant on the Faven Fire Department for 33 and a half years. And when did you retire? Two years ago, in February. And how long did you work for the fire department? Uh, 33 and a half years. And when you retired, what rank were you? A lieutenant. And prior to that, what other ranks did you hold, if any? I was a firefighter for four and a half years. And what is the job of the lieutenant at the Fairhaven Fire Department? What do you do? What uh, did shift you do? commander. We, did, we ran the shift, did inspections, responded to fire calls, did training. And where is the fire department in relation to the police department? In the same building, uh, just next door. And have you received any hazmat training? We get some of that, yes. What, what does that mean? What am I asking you about? You're asking about hazardous materials? Yes, I am. Um, it's usually things that are out of the ordinary, that uh, are usually uh, chemically related or some endangered to the environment that uh, require special training to handle the situation. And as the lieutenant for the, the fire department, was that one of the things that you did? I went to those classes. So I'm going to draw your attention now to um, back a couple of years ago when you were still with the fire department. That would be July 13th of 2014. Were you working that day? Yes. Okay, and what were you doing that day? Do you remember what you were doing when you got the call? Just in the station. And did you get a call from a police officer or from somebody else? Our calls usually originate from the uh, police dispatcher. And uh, do you guys have, does the fire department have a separate dispatch or do you utilize the same dispatch? So. Strike that. Let me ask a better question. Can, the, can a dispatcher at the police station also dispatch you guys? Yes. Okay. So if a call comes in for the police department, do they have the option of, of uh, dispatching police, medics, and fire department all from the same place? Yes. Okay. So back again, uh, back to July 13th, uh, 2014, were you asked to go someplace? Yes, I was. And where were you asked to go? Uh, Kmart parking lot. And could you please describe the route you would have taken, strike that, could you please describe how far away the fire department is from the Kmart, Kmart parking lot? It's a very short distance, I'd say a half of a mile. I could actually borrow uh, the, the first floor that I put in, with the court's permission. Uh, the other one. Thank you. I'm going to show you what's been introduced as Exhibit 4. Did, it, did I actually show you this earlier today? Yes, you did. If I may approach the witness? You may. Thank you. Thank you. you can just hold it there. And yes. Uh, okay. um, you're uncomfortable. <laughs> what are we looking at here? Uh, whatever you're comfortable with. What, you you have a, uh, a picture taken from the air of the, uh, the vicinity of uh, Kmart in the surrounding area. Okay. And where I wrote Kmart, would you agree that that's Kmart? Yes. Okay. And I know that the police station's not on the map, but could you point us in the direction where it would be if, if this was a larger blow up? It would be down the street on this side here. Over here? Yeah. So about a half a mile away, give or take? Yes, it's not far at all. Okay. And uh, would you be able to take this road here, Manor Drive to Washington Street, or would you come up Elizabeth Street? No, we'd come up Washington Street. Okay, so right here? Yes. Okay. And is there a way to get into the came our parking lot from Washington Street. Yes, there is. Now, Lieutenant, in your time with the uh, with the fire department, would you say that you became familiar with the roads and how the roads connect to each other with, at, um, in Fairhaven? Yes. And are you familiar with how one can get in and out of that Kmart parking lot? Yes. 
in what are the ingress or egresses into that parking lot? What roads do you, road or roads do you need to use? You can get into it off of Washington Street. Uh, you can also get into it off of Alden Road Extension. Okay. All right. Now, may I approach your honor? You may. Thank you. And I, did I show you another, another couple of blow-ups this morning? Yes, you did. Okay. So showing this one here, or do you recognize this area here? Yes, that's the entrance off of Washington Street. And it says Washington Street right there yes, at the it bottom. Does, yeah. And is that the Kmart we see with the, uh, the big red K there? Yes. And what is this area here? That's just an egress and an, and an entrance into the uh, facility. So this is Washington Street here on the bottom. And would that be how you get in and then how you get out? That's correct. And is this sort of a commercial building here as well? It's a bank. Thank you. Um, and would this area here in front of Kmart be a parking area for Kmart? Yes, and there's also a lane that goes through so you can transverse the parking lot. Are there other stores on the other side of Kmart? Yes. Now this area here that in front of Kmart, that sort of open area, did that Kmart have a area where um, seasonal items might be kept um, during the summertime or warmer months where that would be kept sort of in an open area there? Yes, they had a garden shop. And does this blow up fairly and accurately depict the view from Washington Street into the sort of side area of Kmart, as you recall it back then? Yes. Your Honor, I would ask that this be marked, please. Is there an objection? Maybe marked. Maybe number 14, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. Over here, I'll have one more, sir, if I may. Go ahead. And um, is this also an area from Washington Street? Yes, it is. And would this be that ingress and egress here, but we're sort of further over that being the bank you've described here? That's correct. So this is a sort of a view of the tree areas from Washington Street, but the view towards Kmart. Kmart would be behind the bank from this view. Over there. Yes. Okay. And does this flow up fairly and accurately depict the area of Washington Street with the ingress and egress to the right and the Kmart not being visible anymore? Yes. Your Honor, I would ask to be marked, please. Maybe mark is 15, please. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to kind of bar them back. Thank you. Okay. So. Back to where we left off. So it's July 13, 2014. You're getting a call, correct? Yes. You're at the fire station. Yes. What do you do? Where do you go? Uh, I jump in the first run truck and uh, drive up to uh, where I was dispatched to. And when you say truck, would that mean a, a fire truck to the rest of us? It's a fire engine, yes. Okay. And where'd you go? Uh, to the side of the um, uh, garden shop. I may approach again? You may. Thank you. And do you recall what ingress and egress you use, showing you Exhibit 14, would you have used this uh, going in here? Yes, I would. Right there? Okay. And would that bring you along? You could either go in front of Kmart or to the side where the garden area is. That's correct. And did you know where you were going to? Yes. And where did you go, sir? That, to that side of uh, the, the garden center. Okay. So now, okay. thank you very much, Madam Clark. showing you now exhibit five does that area look familiar to you yes and would that be where i rode kmart there yes would that be the garden area there that i'm circling yes it would so can you uh, point to the court so i would am i holding that one okay thank you and i'm going to hold exhibit 14 so would you have come in here that way and ended up right, gone along here yes. and ended up there. Yes, there's a little cut out here that we normally come through and drive over here. Okay, great. Thank you. And when you pulled up here closer to where I put the X mark, can you tell the court what you saw then? Well, there were uh, a couple of cruiser cars, a few police officers, and uh, there was a black uh, pickup truck or a dark pickup truck. And did you recognize any of the officer or officers on scene? 
Yes, I did. And who'd you see? Uh, Sergeant Sabral, Sergeant David Sabral, Officer David Career, Officer Mark Damafall. And are these all officers you've worked with over the years? Yeah, oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, sir, uh, without going into the details of what anyone said to you, what was your understanding of why you needed to go from the fire department? At that time, we had received, uh, previous to that time, we had received an advisory from the state fire marshal's office that uh, people were committing uh, suicide by chemical reaction, and they were mixing a few chemicals together and creating a, to a toxic atmosphere, and we were to be on the lookout for that type of setup in a car. Okay. And now when you arrived, where, uh, was the car still shut, clo doors closed completely when you got there? Yes, they were. And was it your understanding, had anyone opened the doors yet, or were they still remaining closed? No, Sergeant Sabral had come up to me, and he asked me to check out the vehicle. He wasn't sure if any of that was involved or not. And did you, in fact, check out the vehicle? Yes, I did. Please tell the court uh, how you did that. Well, walked up slowly, naturally, uh, from a corner. Looked into the side windows and the back windows. This type of chemical agent that people were using at the time, it, the best way to describe it would be like you had an open bucket and you put some expansion foam in it mm -hmm. and it was all nice and small in the beginning and then it expands and kind of froths over. That's what we look for in that type of situation. And also the, the windows uh, would be foggy. In this particular case, were the windows foggy? No. Sir, at what point, and fair to say at some point you realized there is a, a young man in the car? Yes. At what point when you were examining the vehicle or the outside of the vehicle, did you notice that there was a young man in the car? Where fairly, were you? Fairly quickly. I was on the side, on the driver's side. You are on the driver's side. Now, when you looked around, did you see anything that your training told you that it means it's dangerous to open the car? No, I saw nothing that... It was a hazard to the uh, first responders. And did you, just yes or no, did you then inform the responding officers that you hadn't found anything that would cause you concern based on your training and experience? Yes. What happened then? I opened the door. So is it your memory that you were the first person to open the door? Yes. And when you opened the door, uh, what did you see inside? And if you could explain body position to the best of your ability as well. Uh, there was a, a potty inside the vehicle. Uh, the head was kind of like backwards and into the corner. It was like a crew cab type situation. You had the front seat in a small cab space and couldn't see his head at first. If I may, Showing you a portion of Exhibit 6, Photo 5, for the record. Does this uh, picture look familiar to you? Not that you took it or anything like that, but does the person inside in the body position look familiar to you? Yes. Okay. And is that uh, the position you found the, the uh, gentleman in, uh, the young man in when you opened the door? Yes. So head sort of to the side. Um, and fair to say in Exhibit 6, head not visible from the outside. Correct. So based on the body position, the head, would, unless you looked inside, you could not see Conrad's head uh, unless you got closer and looked inside. Yes. At that point, sir, having been called to check for anything of concern, what was your role, if any, going to be now that the door has been opened and you found a young man inside in that body position that we've just discussed? Uh, I looked to see what his condition was. And did you notice any signs of life? No, I did not. So what was your next job, if any, relative to this case? Uh, I made sure that the ambulance was on the way and that uh, when it left the station, it had two paramedics on it. And 
is the paramedics and EMTs, and fair to say those are two different, different things, paramedic is additional training for being an EMT? Yes, uh, a big difference in the level of training. And do, because a lot of towns or cities, the EMTs are a separate agency from the fire department. In Fairhaven, uh, is EMS or the EMTs and paramedics, are they the same agency as the fire department or are they a separate and distinct agency? Uh, we're the same agency. We, so, have, we have both. So as a lieutenant, would you be in charge of the EMTs and paramedics? Yes. So now being in charge of the EMTs and paramedics, what was your role going to be in making sure that paramedics and EMTs came? I just ordered them to come. Okay. And did, and did they? <laughs> yes, they did. Okay. Uh, and did they arrive on scene uh, shortly thereafter, your order? Yes, it wasn't a long time. Okay. Um, and when they got there, what was, now you being sort of their boss, what were they being called to do? Given the fact that you see no signs of life, what was their job going to be? They're a higher level of training, so I, I, one thing they would do would reinforce my decision, uh, whether or not to resuscitate in the beginning. And uh, I'm not positive, but I thought they could uh, pronounce someone okay. at their level of training. So just because you make certain findings, you need someone else with more training to also say uh, there are no signs of life? Yes. Did you stay on scene while that was done? Yes, I did. And just. Uh, briefly describe what was done, please. Uh, I walked away from the uh, vehicle and they went up to the vehicle and did their examination. And afterwards, at some point, sir, was the medical examiner's office called, to your knowledge? At some point in time, yes. Do you have a policy with the, um, in your particular town when someone presents with a certain with no signs of life and um, in an ability to, uh, to um, resuscitate them, is there a policy then as to where the individual is going to go? Meaning do you take them to the hospital when they are, have no signs of life and they cannot be resuscitated? No, we do not. Did you stay on scene after, uh, when the medical examiner's office or the, uh, the courier arrived? No, I believe I was not there. Okay. Sir, after being on scene, determining there was no hazardous materials and ordering um, EM EMTs and paramedics to arrive to um, confirm your findings, did you have any additional uh, role relative to this matter? Actually, all I did was I remember moving the truck uh, to block the entrance so that no cars could get into the area. Now, you're familiar with this area of, uh, are you familiar with this area of Kmart? Yes, I am. And being a firefighter or a lieutenant there for so many years, are you familiar with uh, sort of the when Kmart is busier versus when it's not busy? Not necessarily, no. Did you know what hours Kmart was open at that time on an on a average day? At least 12 hours. Okay. And this particular area where uh, this pickup truck was where Mr. Ro uh, Conrad Roy was found. Is that a parking area? There are parking spaces there, yes. No more questions at this time. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you very much. Mr. Dahl, any questions, sir? Yes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. This bulletin you spoke of, through was it the state that issued a bulletin about hazmat suicides? Is that what? Yes, sir, they did, the State Fire Marshal's Office. And so what, they had a number of suicides, so they put out a bulletin? Yes. Okay, nothing further. Thank you very much. Any redirect? Was that statewide, sir? Yes. Okay, just, just want to clarify. Thank you. All right. All time, Mr. Scott? Yes. Sir, you may step down. You are free to go. Thank you for your assistance. In Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, it's perhaps it's a good time to end for the day, do you think? Yes, Your Honor. May I see Council Sidebar for one moment, please? Thank you.